business, so I'm always glad to be here. Uh, and it's, it, I remember back in the day where this community college was a small entity, and I'm just so proud of how big it's expanded and what Dr. Ivory and company and staff have done with it. Um, I'm here to talk about the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, and I know that you had a presentation last week from Don Eisen, our new, very competent um, U.S. Attorney, very proud of her, first African American woman to hold that position. And so we work collaboratively, and I'm happy to work with her and other partners, and some of our partners that we work with are in this room. And so the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office is, I think, the 18th or 19th largest prosecutor's office in the country. We used to be 11th but many, many years ago, but the downturn in population, we are now about 18 or 19. We are the most diverse prosecutor's office, among the most diverse prosecutor's office in the nation, um, outside of New York, LA, and Chicago. We have all kinds of ethnicities, religions, and, and all of the demographics here. So we are very proud to serve them all. We are a county of about just under 2 million people. It's about 1.85 million people. Wayne County has 43 townships, municipalities, and cities. And that's important to know in a few minutes because most people think Wayne County is just the city of Detroit, and it's not. We have another 42 cities that we deal with. We deal with almost 90 police agencies, and we work with law enforcement, community members, uh, elected officials, everybody all the time. So Wayne County has a different system than some, or I should say the state of Michigan. You, when you watch TV and the legal procedurals on TV, you see district attorney. Everybody knows what a district attorney is. Well, a prosecutor is the same thing. An elected prosecutor in a district attorney system, you have several counties together that make up the district, so they call them district attorneys, like they do in LA and, and New York, for example, and most places in the country. And Michigan and Ohio and a few other cities, we have the prosecutorial system, which is county-based. So Michigan has 83 counties, and each county, no matter how big, even if they have 10,000 people, and we do have some counties uh, up north like that, they still have their own elected prosecutor. Of course, Wayne County is the largest by far. We do about 65, 75, 65 to 70 percent of all of the criminal work in the state of Michigan. So we have our 65 and the other 35 are the rest of the 82 counties. So we do a lot of work. We do anywhere from 18 to 22 to 22,000 cases a year. So we are extremely busy. And I want to just give you a little bit of, of, of history, not history, a little bit of uh, flavor since you heard from the U.S. Attorney last week. You probably heard from her there's a federal system and a state system. We are the state system. Most of the crimes that we charge can only be charged under state law. And so you, can, you see things like, and I'm sure she talked about this last week, civil rights and some, uh, a lot of other felony cases they do as well, but we do the bulk of the felony cases and the misdemeanor cases as well. We are unlike Georgia, for example, that has a, an elected prosecutor just for felony cases, and they also have elec elected prosecutors for misdemeanor cases called solicitors. Very, very different system. Here in Michigan, all county prosecutors do misdemeanor and felony cases. So I want to just tell you a little bit about how a case goes through the system. You did hear from Judge McConnell last week who told you about 36 district court, I'm assuming. We have 26 other district courts in Wayne County. Of course, 36 being the largest. And then we have some, we have Dearborn District Court and Dearborn Heights District Court. And wherever you are in Wayne County, but some courts are combined. So we used to have, I think, 28 district courts that we go to, but now it's some courts are combined due to resource issues and other, and just because it's more uh, efficient. So when a case comes for us, um, comes to us, before it comes to us, it's prepared by whatever local jurisdiction that case comes from. So let's say you have a, a homicide in Wyandotte, then the Wyandotte Police Department would collect all the evidence, bring us what's called a warrant packet, and then we would decide whether we're going to charge or not charge a case. So that goes for every single city and municipality in Wayne County. They each have their own police departments, and so each of them prepares their cases accordingly. Now, when a case comes to us from whatever city in Wayne County, whatever 43 cities, there's a process and a system that we go through. Um, first, they bring us to the, the warrant package, as, as I said, and we will make a decision about whether we're going to charge a case or not charge a case. The police do not charge cases. Only lawyers in the prosecutor's office can charge cases. They might be able to recommend, they may have an opinion, but we are the one that actually signs and decides what charges are going to issue. So they'll bring it to our group of lawyers called the warrant prosecutors. Again, 
they will look at that case and they will decide whether we're going to charge or not charge. Sometimes a case needs more work and we send it back to the police agency to do that more work, for example. And this is just a, a scenario I'm making up. This is not attributable to any department. You could have an assault that happens in a bar. There are 43 people in the bar. When the police bring us the information, they've only taken statements from five people. So clearly that is not enough for us to charge. We have to get all the information we have. And so we, we may send it back to do to get the surveillance cameras. We may send it back to talk to other witnesses. We may send it back because we need forensic work done and the lab has to be contacted. So there could be a number of reasons why we either don't issue or do issue. We may, may need more work to be done. So if we decide that there's enough there for us to bring us uh, to, to issue a charge, we will issue that charge, and then that case then goes across the, well, if it happened in Wyandotte, it would go to the Wyandotte District Court for what's called a preliminary examination. So since we're in Detroit, let me just stick with Detroit. So they bring us a case. We decide that there's going to be a charge. They walk, they walk it across the street. It gets signed by what's called a magistrate, and the magistrate will decide whether they're going to sign the case or not, and then it goes to a hearing called an arraignment on the warrant. We call it AOW, arraignment on the warrant. And at the arraignment on the warrant, the judge, that's the first time a judge, a full fledged judge will see it. The judge will then decide what the bond is. And despite what you may have seen in the papers recently, the judge has a file with everything in it that they need to know. They will have the investigator's report, and they have enough in that file to make a competent decision about what the bond should be. And so they'll look at that. Sometimes there'll be, well, there'll be a defense attorney there arguing for the bond, because that's the defendant's first appearance in court. And uh, most of the time, we do not have a prosecutor there to argue what the bond is because we just don't have the resources. We've never had the resources to uh, have a prosecutor at every single arraignment on the warrant case that we have because, like I said, we do 18,000 to 22,000 cases a year. So uh, the judge uses the information in that file, or they're supposed to use the information in that file. The defense may argue that they w about what they want the bond to be. Um, most of the time, we do have the officer in charge from whatever department that we're talking about, so we're, we're talking about Detroit, we'll, we'll usually have an officer in charge there, and they are tasked with responsibility of letting the judge know about the case as well. The judge makes a bond decision, and if it is going to be a bond that they make, that a defendant can make, they will then post that bond. Um, but when, when I say that my example, it's a homicide, so I'm more than likely, I hope not, there's not going to be a bond set for that. So the, the next hearing will be set for the preliminary examination, so it goes from bringing the warrant package to us to us making a decision, to if a decision is made, you go over to the district court, whatever your jurisdiction is, you have a, uh, you have the magistrate will sign the warrant, there'll be an arraignment on the, on the warrant, and then a bond will be set, and the defendant will be either guilty or not guilty, enter that plea into the system. So then the next step is the preliminary examination. The pl preliminary examination takes place in the same courthouse wherever the case is, if it's Wyandotte, the AOW and the pre preliminary examination will be in the Wyandotte District Court. If it's Detroit, like we're talking about, it will be in Detroit. A pre preliminary examination is not a trial. It is a hearing to determine if there's probable cause that a, the crime that we have charged is committed and probable cause to believe the defendant is the one that committed it. The defense attorney can either waive or hold the examination, and that means if the defense attorney looks at it in consultation with his or her client, then they might decide for many reasons. Sometimes it's strategic. Sometimes they say, okay, we think preliminarily there's enough evidence to go forward. They're not admitting their guilt to the crime at all, and so they do what's waiving it, and it goes on to the circuit court. If they decide to have an exam, we will have our, they will give us a date. It's usually within 14 days. When the examination date comes, um, again, they can either waive or hold. If they hold it, we will have our witnesses there uh, to present to the judge that we have enough ca uh, evidence here that we're going to present that shows uh, the probable cause that the crime was committed and probable cause that the defendant is the one that committed it. It is not a trial. We do not bring all the witnesses in. We only bring enough witnesses in to make, that make the judge be able to make that determination about whether the case is going to continue. Uh, sometimes, depending on the information that comes out at the examination, we, the prosecutor, may make a motion to uh, up the bond, for example. Things come out through the witnesses that um, either we didn't anticipate or we, we didn't know or it's, it's so powerful when the witness testifies, we think if the bond is inappropriate, we can make a bond motion to increase the bond. Sometimes, in some cases, we may hear the evidence from the witnesses and say, well, we're going to dismiss this count. 
um, because we will say, well, let's say the defendant is charged with five counts. The examination testimony showed that four counts, four of the five were probable cause to prove that the, the case happened and probable cause that this defendant is the one that did it. But the evidence only came out on four of those counts, so we, it, sometimes we will dismiss that count right then and there as we know we can't go forward. So let's say the, the judge then makes the decision to what's called bind the case over, and what that means is we're going to send the case up to the next highest court, which is the Wayne County Circuit Court. Remember I told you we have 26 district courts around the county? Well, the circuit court will hear all the cases, no matter which county it came from, or if it came from the Wayne County Sheriff, or if it came to the, from the airport police, or it came from uh, some, some other place that we, we go get cases from. So every case that's bound over goes over to the uh, Wayne County Third Circuit Court, which is the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice. And sometimes an exam, for example, we may have charged a felony, but the evidence comes out that it's only a misdemeanor, well then that case will stay in that district court. Only the felony cases will move on to the circuit court. So or, or sometimes you have cases where you have some felonies and misdemeanors attached to it, where the case will go over to the, the circuit court because you have some felony charges there. After that happens, we will um, have, you know, it will go to the first hearing in the circuit court, which is called an AOI, arraignment on the information, because once you have that exam or the exam is waived, then those are formalized charges. So it's, it's an, an information then. The, the piece of paper or the document is called an information. We do not have the grand jury system here. You may have heard a lot about that on the news lately as it go, relates to Flint Water. But we do not have the grand jury system, which usually consists of 16 people that will be, if like in New York or L.A. or almost every other major city, has a grand jury system. And the grand jury system will, will decide on the charges through indictments. We do not have that here. We do have a, a mechanism called the one-man grand jury, but I'm not going to talk about that today because it doesn't, it's not a part of the process that I'm talking about now, the general process. So it goes over to the circuit court. Like I said, they had that first hearing that's called an arraignment on the information. The defendant must be there, um, the defense attorney, the prosecutor. And it's basically a, a court where the defendant may say, I don't want to have a jury trial. I want to have a bench trial. A bench trial is where the judge decides. I don't want a jury to decide my case. I want a judge to decide my case. And it's called a bench trial or a wa waiver trial or a judge trial. That's all the same thing. And if so, that case will stay in the arraignment and on the information court. Or the defendant is the first defendant's first opportunity to plead guilty. If they want to plead guilty, if they've gotten a good offer from my office and they want to take advantage of it, if they are guilty, they want to take advantage of the offer, maybe we're going to dismiss some other counts. Maybe we're going to say, well, we don't, we're not asking for any prison time or we're not, ask, we're not asking for any jail time. So they want to take advantage of the offer that we've had. The first time to do that is at the arraignment on the information. Generally, most cases, uh, the defendant um, still asserts his or her um, not guilty plea, and then the, the case is sent to one of the many judges we have in the criminal courthouse, Frank Murphy Hall Justice. I don't even know how many judges we have now. It's, it, it's about, it's over 25. It used to be much more than that, but it's over 25 judges we have in the criminal division. Uh, I should tell you that, that Wayne County, our court system is very different from every, every other county. Every other county in the state of Michigan, the other 82 counties, we have 83, we're the 83rd, they have a separate division. They have a separate criminal division. I mean, they have no separate division. Everything's together. So a judge in those counties will do civil cases, and those are cases generally where people are suing for money. Family cases, and those are just very, very generally uh, divorce cases, ca child custody cases, and uh, the many other things that the, that the um, family division does. And then there's a, a criminal division. Uh, it, they do criminal cases, all three type cases. Wayne County is the only county in the state that has three separate divisions. We have a criminal division, we have a civil division, and we have a family division, which includes the juvenile court as well. So I just wanted to mention that so there's no confusion. So once the case is, is what they call blind drawn or a judge is selected for a case that goes forward, then that case will stay in that judge's courtroom that was selected for that case. So in that judge's courtroom, they will have uh, they have very different hearings. It used to be very, very similar, but most judges do things differently now. And so we could have pretrial conferences, we can have motion hearings, we can have, uh, and then we can actually have, of course, the trials that take place. I should tell you that now, um, Wayne County was always known for getting cases through the system very quickly, anywhere from 90 to 120 or 180 days. If it took a back pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic if a case was still in the system after six months, it was because there's forensic or DNA testing that has to be done. 
It could be the defendant was asserting a mental defense and he, had to be, he or she had to be examined by the forensic center or by a psychologist or a psy psychiatrist. Those are the things that would cause delays in the past. Now, because of the pandemic, we are, and it's very foreign to us, the, we're still looking at cases that happened in 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. As a result, because courts were closed for so long, we have a huge backlog of cases, which is very, very difficult to deal with because we like to have the victim of the crime and the defendant to get their, ca their cases through the system very, very quickly. I should tell you something very, very, uh, another thing about the prosecutor that people do not know and they were very surprised by. Prosecutors have dual responsibility, not just to represent the people of the state of Michigan, but we also must make sure that the defendant has all of his or her due process rights. So we have a kind of a dual responsibility prosecutors do. And so that's kind of a, a way how the system works in, in Wayne County and across the state, how cases are done. And if in that courtroom the trial is done, after that the, it, and, and the defendant is found guilty or either pleads guilty or is found guilty, there's a sentencing report that's ordered. It's called a pre-sentence pre investigation report. And it gives the judge all kinds of information about the defendant so they can make an informed decision about what the sentence would be. They'll talk about the defendant's home life, how he or she was raised, any kind of mental health issues, um, the prior record of the defendant, uh, the educational history of the defendant, um, the psychology of the defendant, all of that will be contained in this report. And the prosecution and defense rely on that to decide, for, for the prosecutor to decide what we're going to recommend to the judge that we want as a sentence. And of course, the, the defendant uses it to do whatever they want to do with the report. And then the judge uses it. I was a, a circuit court judge for nine years before I became the elected prosecutor. Before that, I was an assistant prosecutor. And we use those reports because we want all of the information in those reports. Those reports are done by the probation department. So we can make an intelligent um, sentence to that for that defendant, whether it's probation or whether it's probation and jail time, whether it's prison time, we, whether, you have, whether they have to you know, stay drug free, finish school, continue to work. There's all kinds, or in certain kind of cases, you have to stay away from the victim. Um, if we have like a sexual assault or a domestic violence or a child abuse, we may have other conditions. So any condition you may, you may uh, think of, drug treatment, alcohol treatment, mental health treatment, if they're placed on probation, then they must fulfill all of those conditions for their probation to be eventually uh, dismissed. And sometimes th they're not dismissed. Sometimes the defendant will violate that probation. The case will come back to that, the, the original judge, and then they will make a decision on whether probation should be continued, whether probation should be revoked and then sent to jail or prison, or those kinds of decisions. So that's, that's how the system works. So I want, to, or it's supposed to work. So I want to just talk a little bit about what we have in my office. Um, you already know we have the group of lawyers who decides the charges, but we have other lawyers as well. I should tell you my office, and it changes every day. Um, my office has about, about 150 prosecutors, but we should have 325. So that's why we have the heaviest caseload per prosecutor than any place else in the United States of America. We have the heaviest workload. So, um, and that brings with it its other problems as well. So, um, the way the office is set up, uh, and I'm gonna really, we're, we're changing because we have to deal with getting these cases through the system, but the, the way that we, we like the office to be set up, we have what's called vertical prosecution, and we have what's called horizontal prosecution. And this is what I mean by that. Some cases are so tough and so complex that we want the same prosecutor to handle that case all the way through the system. And the overwhelming majority of our cases, we have the prosecutors that decide the warrant, the prosecutors who do, uh, different prosecutors who do the preliminary examination that I talked about earlier, a set of prosecutors that will do the trials uh, and all the pretrial work, and another set, set of prosecutors that will do the appellate work. Our appellate lawyers or the writers, they're the ones that defend our convictions with the Court of Appeals, with the Michigan Supreme Court. So when you have a gun case or you have a breaking entering case, those are the types of cases that are easier with horizontal prosecution. When you have a child abuse case, and we have a lot of child abuse cases, uh, we do be between probably in, in a normal time, when whatever normal is now, but pre-pandemic, we, we get between 350 and 400 serious child abuse cases a year. And so we have a child abuse unit that's part of our SVU, Special, special Victims Unit. Our SVU unit takes care of child abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, the rape kits that were talked about earlier, um, 
Let me see what else did they animal protect protection. Well, why do you do cases can with animals? Because it shows that if you have people who abuse animals, these are people that generally can turn into very dangerous people. And oftentimes animal abuse in domestic violence cases is used as a sword. What I mean by that is if you leave me, even though I am abusing you, I will kill the family dog. So that's why we do, and then we have, you know, when children are bitten by, and it happens a lot, by pit bulls or killed by a pit bull, that unit will do those type of cases because there's different laws that really deal with that. But anyway, so those are all, or elder abuse, another part of our uh, SVU unit, elder abuse, because we have, uh, yes, the older I get, the younger it sounds, but we have uh, elder abuse starts at age 55. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, the, if the victim is 55 on up. But we also have, you know, cases like, um, you know, we read in the paper this week, we had a 95-year-old woman who was carjacked. We have, and sometimes, you know, and, and the reason why we have SVU, because you have to have specialized training to work in this unit, but you also, for example, in an elder abuse case, the prosecutor has to be well-versed in dementia and Alzheimer's, because a lot of people that we service and have things happen to them, because they are vulnerable, be, they pick people and people they think are vulnerable. So dementia, um, like I said, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, we have lots of financial fraud, where family members will steal the fortune of our seniors. Uh, our people abused in a nursing home, we get a lot of that. Um, people are raped in a nursing home, unfortunately, we get a lot of that. We have uh, se seniors that are com in a coma state in a nursing home, and they still get sexually assaulted. So we see all kinds of things, and those lawyers have to be um, prepared and well-trained. So with the child abuse cases, you know, we have, it's, it's unfortunately, it's not unusual that we have a six-year-old girl who has been sexually assaulted by her father, her brother, her uncle, the neighbor down the street, all kinds of people. Uh, and so you want to have a very small circle of people that deal with that child. You don't want to have them talk to the warrant prosecutor and then talk to the preliminary examination prosecutor and then talk to the trial prosecutor. The trial prosecutor may change because the person who's supposed to do the case is tied up in a, in a murder case that took three weeks. And so you don't want to have them talk to six and seven and eight different people. You want to have one prosecutor, to the extent that we can, handle that child. So when that, when that prosecutor comes in, the, they talk to the child about their, you know, about the, to find it, because we have a second set of prosecutors, they do the warrants too for child abuse cases. They talk to the child about what happened to them in the warrant stage. Then they will take that, ca that child in that case to the court system and do the exam. And then they will stick with that child when they do the trial. So they talk to one person. And that is where the way that we, it should be done because there are very sensitive cases. We do domestic violence cases like that as well. It's very hard to prosecute domestic violence because that is a very challenging type of crime. We often have, uh, when I get to five minutes, let me know. We often have uh, women and men that are abused through domestic violence. And I should tell you, and this is a shocking statistic, but we get 10,000 cases of domestic violence requests a year. 10,000. And it's not just Detroit, it's all over the, the county of Wayne. In fact, all the crimes we do are all over the county of Wayne. Some cities may have certain crimes that we see more than others. Some cities will have a bigger auto theft problem or a bigger, uh, any, any kind of problem. And so, um, with, with our domestic violence cases, oftentimes, and especially during the pandemic, you had the abuser and the person that was being abused together in the same house because it's taking a long time for these cases to get through the system. And so oftentimes in these cases, and I'm not uh, at all disparaging these women at all. I'm saying women because it's mostly women. But they often don't want to follow through and don't want to prosecute. Why? It's a, it's a psych social psychology of domestic violence and it's very hard to deal with. Oftentimes the person who's abused them is, is helping them take care of their children. They're providing their housing. They may not work outside the home. So they have to rely on the person that's abusing them for everything. And it's very, very hard. Even if they are severely abused, it's very, very hard. And some people say, well, why don't you just walk away? Well, it's not that easy. It's easy for people on the outside looking in to say that, but it's very difficult. So we have specially trained prosecutors that deal with um, domestic violence cases. Sexual assault, the same thing. If someone is sexually assaulted, the child sexual assaults, of course, go to the child abuse unit. Um, but the adult sexual assault cases, if you're 18 or over, and actually it's you know, a little, little lower than that, we want specialized prosecutors that know how to deal with sexual assault. Sexual assault is another crime that is very, very difficult to try for many reasons because it's really the only crime where sometimes law enforcement don't believe them, um, they're not taken seriously, 
um, and I'm not picking on law enforcement, not just law enforcement, and I'm not picking on any of our cities, but in other states. Um, the, police, the police department don't take them seriously. Um, they say, well, if you were raped, how come you don't have any injuries? Um, and no one knows how they're going to react when they are sexually assaulted. You may just want to protect yourself and just go along with whatever the man wants to do. They may have a weapon, and it's more important for you to be alive for your children and your family. And so you allow, I, I say allow, but you know, that's not the proper word, but you know what I'm saying. And so, they're very, so someone who's sexually assaulted is not always going to have injuries. In fact, most of the time, they're not going to have injuries. And so, again, specialized unit, they will deal with the warrant, they will deal with the preliminary examination, they will deal with the trial. Vertical prosecution is what that is, vertical prosecution. Some of our other vertical prosecution areas are homicide. Uh, most of our homicides are done in our homicide unit. Uh, we have a lot of them. Um, and not a lot of people, a lot of uh, cases, because we're talking countywide, and I'm not, countywide, 43 cities, and the sheriff's department, and the airport police. And we had, you know, last year we had a, a quite a few issues that were happening at the airport that we had to deal with as well. So no homicides at the airport, but a lot of sexual assault. And so um, our homicide unit, we want to try to deal with the, the, the grieved family. We don't want to have them talk to five different prosecutors. Now, I have to tell you, unfortunately, that happens now because of our, our people who are leave. They can't take the stress of the huge caseloads that we have. And so we, but we try to keep that at a minimum, the people that talk to uh, the family of homicides. And so, of course, there are, there are the more experienced prosecutors that try these homicide cases with social media and body cameras and green light in Detroit and stock car video, uh, social media. Just on social media alone, we may get, you know, 50,000 pieces of paper that we have to go through. After we wrestle that information away from Facebook, Instagram, and all that, because they don't want to give that to us. And it's always a legal fight to get stuff. You, would, you wouldn't think so, but it is. And so they've got, you know, six boxes of social media stuff to go through. They've got hours and hours and hours of body cam footage to go through. Uh, and so it's very, very difficult on top of everything else that goes with trying a homicide case. So we, got, we try to get our more experienced people to do that. So I don't want to go too much over my time, but that's, that's the way our office is set up. It's got vertical units, and, and I've mentioned most of them, the SVU, homicide. Um, we, we partner with the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in a... In a in a outlet called Operation Legend, where we do um, a lot of the, most of the non-fatal shootings. Um, and so we have a, just a plethora of cases that we do, and I've only talked about it, about half of them. But just very, very quickly, if I, do I have like five more minutes? Okay, so very quickly, I want to just talk about some of the other things we do besides trying cases. In my view, the most important function of a prosecutor is to make sure you put the right cases in the system. You may believe that a person is guilty as sin, but if we don't have the evidence to prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt in court, we cannot charge it. Now, we have some of my colleagues across the state don't have that belief. Some of my colleagues in certain counties, and if you think hard, you could, I'm not going to name them. You probably know who they are. They charge everything that walks through the door. It does, you know, without an investigation, without challenging the police work, without asking for additional information, and then let it fa fall where they may later on. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right at all. Because I view the charging function in prosecutor's office the most important. None of us are perfect. Sometimes mistakes are made. We, we charge with all the information we have available to us at the time. Sometimes that may change. Sometimes a witness will say, no, I was lying to you. Sometimes we get um, the DNA, and, it, and, it, and it, this is rare. We get the DNA, and it points to another person. My prosecutors are charged with dismissing that case as soon as you know you can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So we encourage our prosecutors that even after we have charged a case, if you're preparing that case for trial, you don't think you've got the right person or you don't think that you can um, prove the case beyond a reason, reasonable, reasonable doubt, we are not offended in the least. If you go to your supervisor and say, either I don't think I have the right person once I've delved a lot more deeper into this, the time has passed, or we we, the most of the time we can't find a crucial witness. That's what happens most of the time now. And we can't make the case without that witness. We've had cases where evidence was lost or destroyed accidentally, so we can't go forward. So. We don't take a person through a trial if we don't think that we don't have enough. Now, that's rarely what happens, but that happens, and we openly encourage people to look at your cases, and if you think you don't have the right, come, we want to dismiss it as soon as possible in the system. Some of my, co my, some of my um, colleagues will say, let the jury decide. And they know they don't have enough to go forward. And I just think that's wrong. 
So that's, that's kind of how we operate because I view that as the most important function because we are the gatekeepers, the prosecutors are. We're the ones that decide which cases to get into the system in the first place, and we don't want to put bad cases in the system, but we're not perfect. So the, I want to talk about two things really quickly, really quickly. We had the first ever um, unit in the state for a lot of things. Uh, for our conviction integrity unit, the first in the state. We have a unit that deals with LGBTQ crime, first in the state, because uh, that was a marginalized community as well. We, had, um, we have a public integrity unit, across the first in the state, um, and that was, I have to not, not to give myself credit for that because that was a form of that was in, in the office before I got there as the elected in 2004, but we expanded it. And we look at uh, that case, that unit we look at um, police brutality cases, police shootings, police misconduct, official misconduct, like a, you know, a school board member or a mayor or um, any elected official, uh, principals of schools that have embezzled, um, priests or nuns that have caused you know, some kind of conduct, although if it's children that will go to the child abuse unit. So we look at everything wi 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 widely, you can never say that, widely, W-I-D-E-L-Y, widely, not wildly. So, um, and we think that, that we must have that unit. We look at all kinds of official misconduct, all kinds. And this office, my office was never afraid, especially when I got there. I don't think they were afraid before I got there, got there as the elected to look at police misconduct and charge. Kind of. Now, oftentimes these are highly, char highly charged cases. We're not talking about any case that happened now, so don't ask, that's going on now, so don't ask me. Can't answer it, um, not yet. And so um, sometimes we will charge. If it's there, we can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But even if the community is very upset, if we legally cannot bring that case beyond a reasonable doubt, we will not charge it. I will take the heat every time for not putting a case in the system that doesn't belong there. So the, the last thing we have is we were the first in the state also to, in 2016, have a, a, a conviction integrity unit. And because I think that no prosecutor's office should be afraid to look at past convictions, whether, whether they were there as elected or not, even if it goes back 30, 40 years. I believe very strongly that if you have information or new evidence that a, a, convi a past conviction cannot be sustained, then I believe very strongly that we should look at that. And that's what the convic conviction integrity does. And we have either exonerated or given new trials to. Uh, we may not think the person is guilty, but we think their trial was so flawed and they did not get a fair trial in many respects that they deserve a new trial. And most of the, case, most of the time those cases are so old we can't put them back together anyway. So I believe it's up to 34 men now, I think. Uh, and so we're very proud of that unit and the work that's being done there. And so um, that's kind of a, an overview. I think I'm over time, so I better stop. But that's kind of an overview of what we do. But we do a lot more. It's a very difficult job to do, to do right now. But our, our sole mission is to not only be proactive, and I didn't even talk about the, pro the proactivity programs, the 12 programs we have that are proactive. I haven't talked about our diversion programs or our pre-charge programs or our mediation programs. But we're very strong when it comes to, um, if we can take care of a case before it even gets in the system in the first place, we want to do that too. If we want to have a young person or an adult have another chance at diversion, we will divert their case. And if they successfully complete all of the conditions that we give them, we will dismiss their case. So there's, there's a whole other, I could talk for two hours just about that because I'm, I feel very strongly about diversion in those programs. So let me stop because I'm sure I've talked too long. I think, uh, we want to thank you, Prosecutor Worthy. There are a few questions, and we're going to ask that you keep your questions short. So thank you for what you do, Prosecutor Worthy. What if you had 30% increase to your budget, where would you put it? Gosh, what a great question. Um, right now it's kind of different than what I've been saying all these years because our case, our office has never been properly staffed. Um, we have a CEO, this Warren Evans, who works very closely with us. He gets it. He gets what we need. And he has been very um, oriented to helping us get positions, and we do have positions. The problem that we have now and structural changes and changes that the county must make and other things is we, we're, we've been hit with the great resignation like everybody else. Um, people leave because they decide now that they don't want to come back. They want to work at home and get a job that works at home. Or, or because of the, the pandemic, we have these huge caseloads and they just are afraid to mess up some cases. So right now we're in the position where we have the positions, but we, we don't have enough people to fill them. So we're constantly recruiting, and then at the same, at the other end, we wanna, we wanna be able to retain who we have. 
So, but if we had, let's just say we were filling, that we, all my positions were filled, we really want to double the size of the, uh, the uh, conviction integrity unit. We want to have a system where we can have two people in a courtroom like they have in Chicago, LA, every place. Like in Chicago, I think they have three people in a courtroom. We only have one uh, to deal with the cases and to, to we, we, we want to have cases, we want to have more advocates so we can keep better track of our, 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 our victims. I talked to a mother yesterday on a homicide case where she hadn't heard from our office in two months. And that was not on purpose. It's because we have so much work. It's hard to do. So I could really use more advocates who, on a regular basis, call our victims and let them know that we're still with them. But your case has been adjourned and, and put over for the ninth time, which is very common right now. So there's a number. There's there's other units I would have. I would certainly add more people to my human trafficking cases. Um, that's huge, and we only have one person that deals with them, two, and we probably need five. Uh, add people to our domestic violence because our lawyers are, are carrying 500 cases apiece. And like I said, we have 10, so all kinds of things I would do. Thank you for that question. How you doing, Madam Prosecutor? Oh, Ms. Bruce. Um, uh, what can the NAACP do to be able to help you in terms of getting resources uh, to, the, to your unit to be able to grow that unit? Well, this is perfect because what it allows me to do is to tell the real truth about what prosecutors do and not what you see on TV. Um, I now are in the ro I'm in the role now where I, I'm going personally to the law schools and personally to the schools to recruit and ask people to be prosecutors because the only way you're going to have a fair criminal justice system if you have people of color in all aspects of the criminal justice system. And so we, we want to recruit people who are not of color, but we want to we want to get our ranks higher. And to know that there is nobility, there is, um, there is grace, there is compassion in trying to help people who are victims of crime. We all hear about crime all the time, and we want to do a good job for our crime victims, and for that we need no more people. So it helps when you have forums like that. If you have any kind of job fairs or you have panels that we can be on to uh, get the word out, if you are going to the schools and you want us to join us, get the word out. So th that's the probably the best thing we can do. Um, and um, there are other things too, but that's probably the best thing right now because we want to be able to deliver the services um, fairly. And um, one thing that we've done with some past is when we have families that are very, 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 very upset about our, our either our charging or our lack of charge, we've had pastors come in, we've had our organizations come in and sit with us and um, help us explain everything to the family as well. So that's a, a, a big help too. We have some questions on the chat. Okay. Good morning again. The question in the chat asks, are there alternatives for prosecution of minor crimes other than prosecuting people and giving them a criminal record? Absolutely. And that, that, that's when I, when I talked about the proactive piece. That's what I was talking about. We have diverted. See, I've been the elected prosecutor in Wayne County for 17 years now. And in those 17 years, we have diverted 28,000 people from the criminal justice system, 28,000, both uh, juvenile and adult, because of, because of our diversion program. Uh, we have, for example, we have a, a program in the juvenile court that I, wanna, I want to add to the adult court, but we don't have the resources right now. It's called Talk It Out. It's a mediation program. Before the case even gets to the court for charging, uh, before we even charge, we bring in the parent. The victim is a restorative justice program, and the victim has to participate. We bring in a mediator from Wayne County Mediation, and they decide what should happen. So the victim has input. They may have had their car stolen, for example, and they want the youth to understand what I, I lost my job because you stole my car. I didn't have any way to get to work on time. And so the victim will have I impact on what they want the defendant to do. And if everybody agrees, and it's mediated, like I said, by a, a trained mediator, uh, and then they will agree. And then if they, whatever they agree to, if the young man or young woman does all that, we won't charge that case. That's just one example. We have 12 different diversion programs um, dealing with domestic violence, dealing with sexual assault, deal with, we have truancy, we have huge truancy problems, truancy, we have two uh, programs for that. Uh, we have what's called teen court, which is too long for me to explain, but basically what you have is teen jurors sitting as the decision makers for what happens to the teen defendant or respondent. And they come up with, if I have time to tell that story, I'll tell you tell it later. But yes, we are real big on I am personally real big on diversion. We were doing diversion type programs and restorative justice type programs two th back in 2005 where everybody was laughing at me, saying that's not a prosecutor role, you're being a social worker. And my, my, my retort was, if we don't look at the root causes of crime, then there's no way we're gonna be able to do anything about anything else. 
and we have to treat people differently. If they have not done um, certain things that are not, not serious enough for them to um, have something attached to them in terms of a conviction, if there are ways that we can work it out, um, then we will. Now, I'm not talking about rape or murder and homicide and carjacking. I'm not talking child abuse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about lower level crimes and misdemeanors. So yes, we have a number of programs I could talk about for three hours just on that topic. Last question. Uh, we have a lot of talk in the media about bail, about pre-conviction pre, pre incarceration. Uh, we hear these stories that people are pleading guilty just to get out of jail. What's the, your office's view on this new bail system? Yeah, I am not a proponent of no cash bail ever um, because that, that includes our most serious crimes. And that's, not, that's a disservice to victims for sexual assault and rob, armed robbery, things like that. My position on, on bail has always been there should be no, no cash bail for misdemeanors ex ex accepting stalking and domestic violence, for city ordinances, for traffic offenses except for drunk driving or when someone is killed. Uh, I do not think that there should be cash bail. And since I was a judge for nine years and I set bail for nine years for people or I lowered bail or I rose bail, then you, as a judge, you have to be thoughtful about these decisions. It can't be a knee-jerk decision. You take everything into account, including the defendant's ability to pay, into account before you set bail. So I don't think there should be cash bail for traffic offenses, like, like I said, accepting drunk driving, or someone is killed. And we have a lot of that problem, drag racing, things like that. Uh, city ordinance, why should anybody, you know, no. No, you know, personal bond for uh, s smaller, lower level misdemeanors and some very low level felonies as long as there's not a, a, a track record of not appearing in court or a track record of other crimes. There's just one final question in the chat, and it asks in regards to law school. Uh, the price of law school is over 100K, so what can be done to help attract uh, more minorities to want to work in the prosecutor's office? That, I that is what we're hampered by most times because our law students now, and I, my, my daughter is uh, in her second year of law school, and. And my goal for her is to have her get out of law school debt free, so she has more options. But law school, mo most of my younger prosecutors have $250,000 of law school debt. $250,000, $200,000 as is the average, but $250,000. And uh, it's interesting, because I, I pitched something to um, someone in the governor's office the other day is that the federal government, for example, has loan forgiveness programs that I think the state could mimic. And not just for prosecutors, anyone doing public service. So for nurses or teachers or prosecutors or defense attorneys, or def you know, public defenders, um, there should be a state program that subsidizes that. And so that's the way we attract people because people want to stay and be prosecutors once they see what the real work is and the real rewarding, how rewarding it is to help, help a child that's been um, sexually abused or help a senior who's been beat you know, almost to death or to help you know, whomever, a homeowner who's had their home invaded. And we like the work, they love the work, and even though it's a lot, but they can't afford to stay uh, because they have that law school debt. So we are looking at, there is loan forgiven, lo federal loan forgiveness, but that program is changing. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the way you, where, what, whatever way you want to look at it during the pandemic, they've had not had to pay, um, but they still have those debts on the other end. They're not going to go away. Um, we're still looking at what uh, President Biden is talking about in terms of forgiving loan forgiveness. We don't know exactly what that means, so we're looking at that. Um, but that's the best way we can deal with that law school debt so they don't walk in the door with, you know, $250,000 on their back. So. We want to thank Prosecutor Worthy. Very, very informative discussion. And we're going to move right along now to our discussion on guns, guns, guns.
So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Curtis L. Ivory downtown campus. Uh, we are excited to have the Crockett Law School here once again with uh, just esteemed panelists and speakers, just very informative and educational for the community. Uh, on behalf of our Chancellor, Dr. Curtis L. Ivory, and the Board of Trustees, we welcome you to Wayne County Community College District. We ask that you visit our six campus locations. If you have not had the opportunity to visit our Curtis L. Ivory Health and Wellness Education Center, we ask that you take an opportunity. It belongs to us in the community here in Wayne County. Check it out great classes, state-of-the-art equipment, and just a beautiful facility. Look forward to an opening, uh, an official opening of the Curtis L. Ivory Health and Wellness Center in the very near future. Thank you for being here today and uh, just continue to support Wayne County Community College District. It's the place where learning leads to a better life. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I have the esteem. My name is Dorian Tyus, uh, criminal justice uh, chair with the Detroit branch. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, moderate as well as to have this very important discussion around guns, 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 specifically around gun responsibility, as well as the opportunity to talk about some policy implications as it relates to guns and how it affects our community. Uh, so specifically, before we get in, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, we have specifically to my left, uh, to your left going right, I will introduce them. Uh, you have already met our esteemed prosecutor, uh, Prosecutor Worthy, um, who needs no introduction. Um, she has indicated that she will have to leave early, so when she steps off stage, that is the reason being. Uh, we're very happy to have her. I'm going to read a short little portion here from her bio. Uh, Prosecutor Worthy received her undergraduate degree in economic and political science from the University of Michigan and her law degree from the University of no Notre Dame School of Law. In 1984, she began, her, she began her legal career at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, and in 1989, she became the first African-American selected by the office as a special assignment prosecutor. She specialized in high-profile murder cases, including the prosecution of Tony Riggs and of two Detroit police officers convicted in the beating death of motorist Malice Green. In 1994, Worthy was elected to the Detroit Recorder's Court. During the next nine years, she presided over, nine, over hundreds of serious felony cases and was reelected to the court twice by overwhelming margins. Yeah. Um, to Next, we have our uh, esteemed uh, Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Franklin D. Hayes, who has worked for the De Detroit Police Department for the past 23 years. He received a graduate certificate from Michigan State University School of Staff and Command and the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police School of New Chiefs. He was awarded a Bachelor of Business Administration with a concentration in diversity, leadership, and public safety from Clear University in 2022. Next we have Pastor, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna do it in the order that I have it, I apologize. Uh, Prosecutor Worthy, Deputy Chief to our far left here. Um, we also have um, uh, to the Kofi Kenyatta here is an accomplished fundraiser, community organizer, nonprofit leader, and gun rights advocate. He was born and raised on Detroit's west side and educated in Detroit public schools at Cass Tech. He comes from a long line of community organizers, public servants, and educators. His upbringing and experience as a consciously aware black man were foundationally to his commitment to racial and equi economic e equity, community development, and black liberation. He joined Up Together in 2014 as Detroit site director and led the 
the organization's Michigan's efforts. Under his leadership, Up Together has invested more than $3,400,000 in direct cash to over 7,500 Detroiters. Then we have Pastor Pierce, Kenneth Pierce. Um, Pastor Pierce, through his constant prayer, he hears the voice that directs him to lead, teach, and preach the word of God. Pastor K.C. Pierce II is an anointed preacher and teacher whose vision for God's people enables him to build bridges, reach across denominations, generations, gender, race, culture, and ethnicity, changing the lives and building communities. Uh, Pastor Pierce is the older of two children, born in a Christian and God-fearing household. His parents are Reverend Dr. Keith C. Pierce and Miss Eileen Pierce. Pastor Pierce is the proud father of one son, Kenneth Pierce, and two daughters, Mackenzie and Kinsley Pierce. Pastor Pierce is a graduate of Murray Wright High School. He has furthered his education at Baker College and Oakland Community College. And Pastor Pierce is an alumnus of Ashland Theological Seminary. And uh, finally, last but not least, we have Miss uh, uh, Maya Reed. She has been a full-time college employee for over 28 years and loves empowering students to succeed. Mia is also a licensed clinical uh, mental health counselor and the founder of Change Happens Today, a mental health private practice located in Southfield that offers a safe space for those struggling emotionally and for others needing positive life changes that, that she operates part-time. She's also the founder and CEO of the Charles Reed Community Help Center in memory of her son, Charles, D Charles W. Reed, taken by gun violence in 2011. Uh, CWR is a 501c3 nonprofit that services the city of Detroit and focuses on families impacted by gun violence and poverty. So first of all, we appreciate our esteemed panel that is here today. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the issues specifically around uh, gun violence and guns specifically. And so I'd love to open it up to the panel uh, as it relates to that. Um, a lot of individuals within the community um, have concerns or need more information as it relates to open carry compared to uh, concealed weapons and what that looks like. Can someone give us uh, just a difference or explain the difference between open carry and concealed carry? <clears throat> Again, good morning, uh, everyone, and certainly an honor to be here. So when we talk about open carry versus concealed carry, uh, the first aspect is uh, the licensing. Uh, as it relates to uh, the concealed carry, there is a process uh, in which uh, the County of Wayne uh, issues a permit often referred to as a CPL, concealed, uh, concealed pistol license. Uh, with that, you are able uh, to transport or, or possess a firearm uh, in a covert manner. Uh, you're able to conceal it on your person, uh, there are also provisions uh, with the CPL as it relates to how you're able to transport it. Um, with that, there come some responsibilities as it <coughs> relates to disclosing it should there be uh, any contact with the law enforcement officer, uh, as well as certain venues that you go through uh, based on the CPL, uh, whether it be houses of worship, uh, whether it be sporting events or large assemblies uh, of people, as to whether or not uh, you are able to carry that concealed pistol license. And there are also some different levels uh, of a concealed pistol license. There's an exempt and a non-exempt. Uh, absent of that, uh, Michigan law provides uh, an opportunity for those that uh, do not have a CPL to carry a firearm with an open carry. Uh, an open carry has to be in a holster and it has to be fully exposed. Uh, when we get into areas, well, uh, oftentimes that we see uh, on our uh, law enforcement encounters is that the firearm is not fully exposed. It's tucked in someone's waistband, in their belt. And uh, the rear, often referred to as the magazine well or the, the butt stock, uh, uh, the handle uh, of that firearm is all that's shown. And you say, well, I was open carrying. Uh, you cannot open carry. It has to be, uh, again, fully exposed. None of it, uh, the vision of it uh, cannot be obstructed in any way. Um, and you cannot open carry in a vehicle. Uh, you must follow the transport laws as it relates to a firearm in which it must be uh, in a box, uh, in, a, in a locked uh, container, uh, ammunition separated, uh, and not uh, in the close proximity of a driver. Obviously, if you're in a pickup truck, 
uh, there based on the vehicle, there are certain uh, uh, common sense. And when I say that common sense, I mean from a law enforcement standpoint, when you're interacting with someone, well, it's obviously someone can't put it in the trunk if they're in a pickup truck, but the expectation is that it's in a glove box or it's in, uh, in the passenger, on the passenger side, perhaps under the seat, but out of uh, the direct area or vicinity uh, of the operator. Um, that's just a, a kind of a ground level overview. Uh, I would certainly, uh, Madam Prosecutor, if there's anything I missed, please uh, feel free to chime in. No, I think the, the, the crucial point you've made very well, and that well, two points, you, ha you have to have the permit, and the second thing is it has to be fully exposed. Um, that's, that's what we see most often when, when warrants come to us. So if it's, not, if it's not fully exposed, that's carrying a concealed, or could be carrying a concealed weapon. And, and really quickly, if I could chime in, um, good morning, everyone. Um, outside of being director of policy for Up Together, I'm also the co-founder and current vice president of Black Bottom Gun Club, which is the Detroit chapter of the National African American Gun Association. Um, and I just really wanted to uh, really hone in and focus on one thing that Commander Hayes, excuse me, uh, Deputy Chief Hayes uh, mentioned is that there is no such thing as open carry in a vehicle. Uh, we see a lot of our, our people getting jammed up thinking that because they are able to, legally able to open carry, but once they get into their vehicle, um, as he mentioned, it has to be uh, stored properly uh, in the vehicle. You cannot open carry in the vehicle. Uh, and so just important for us to make sure that our community members are, are aware of that fact uh, and make sure that they are conscious to what they are legally able to do and what they aren't. No, we t I, you talk about some of the common mistakes that individuals have made specifically around open carry. Um, I know one issue, uh, uh, excuse me, not open carry, um, as it relates to open carry and concealed carry. Um, one of the issues that we've discussed in the past was the importance of storage of weapons and how that has an impact on our community. Someone really talk about really the importance of how we properly store firearms and what are some of the implications that may uh, happen when we don't follow those procedures? I would, uh, this, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that, this, this is so critically important, I'm gonna focus on my comments on when, the, when you're home. Um, about six years ago, we had about 27 children that were either killed or seriously injured because the adult in the home, the lawful gun owner in the home did not properly store that gun. Storing a gun properly is not under your bed, it's not on the kitchen table, it's not uh, on the, the, uh, in the crib. We, these are all ex real examples that I'm saying. It's not in the crib where the baby sleeps, it's not, you know, like I said, I think I said kitchen table, it's not next to the toaster in the kitchen, it's not where a child can see it, you know. And so we even had one case where a, a, a gun was stored at the top, on the top of the television where the children were playing their video games. And so uh, I don't care how bad, bad uh, how educated we think our children are when it comes to guns. They are, there's something, some allure, maybe someone can explain that to me. There's some allure to that weapon. And I, there was a Dateline show that was done many years ago where parents who had sworn they had taught their children about not touching guns, they were behind the glass, they set up a gun, of course, empty and unloaded, and each one of those children picked up that gun and tried to point it at somebody. That's what they do. And so we were, uh, I was so outraged and hurt by these children that were being killed whose deaths were completely and totally preventable if the adult in the house had properly stored that gun. So we don't, when, I, when that happens in a home, we don't prosecute the ones that have tried to store their gun. Maybe their parent put it in a lockbox that maybe they left it open, but they didn't know their children knew where it was. And trust me, the kids always know where the guns are. Um, and we're not talking about those. We're talking about, and if you tried to secure it, we're talking about those who leave the gun on the table. And we've had so many of these cases where now children are quadriplegic, they're paraplegic, they're blind. Um, or they're dead, and because the adult didn't secure that gun. So uh, some people in the room may disagree with me, but we are seeking legislation that deals with that because we think that if you cause the death of a child over your neglect, there should be some um, paying for that. And we're not talking about prison, but uh, I have to say, when you look at enough of these cases and you look at, you know, it's probably up to 30 or 40 now, children that over the years that we have seen them lost their lives because, lose their lives because of this. It's a critically important issue. Safe, safe storage, child access, safety, whatever you want to call it, we need to do better. And I agree. That basically is what I was gonna talk about, secure gun storage. And when I'm out in the community talking to um, legally gun owners, 
I am asking them, what is the one thing that you can control? Because we cannot control everything that goes on in our community. There's a lot of things that we want to see changed. But the one thing that we can control is what goes on in our home. So these unintentional shootings, because we didn't want to see that happen, that parent didn't want to see that happen, that three-year-old child that found his parents' gun and shot his sister or brother didn't want that to happen. And it's easy. A gun lock, if you cannot afford a safe, and they are free, you can get them from the police station. Uh, most nonprofits give them out. We give them out. Every Town for Gun Safety Survivor Network has a program where they give out gun locks. Moms Demand Action has a signature program. It is called Be Smart. We want every gun owner to be smart. Now, I also believe that if you are going to house a deadly weapon in your home, that is your right. However, if someone takes that gun out the home and creates a crime or commits a crime or someone in your home is harmed, you should be held accountable. Just as if you are a licensed driver and you are driving drunk. And so when we hold people accountable for not following common sense rules so that they can keep others safe, they should be held accountable. So I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. And this is not, I'm gonna let my brother hear probably or something, but this is not a Second Amendment issue, in my view. This is a child safety issue. Yes. And really quickly, uh, a critical component that we need to discuss is we can all control what's happening in our own homes, um, but a lot of us may drop our, uh, our children or the children in our custody uh, into other people's homes, a friend, a family member. And so it's important that we have that discussion with those individuals as well. Uh, assume they have a firearm in the home and have that discussion with them to make sure that their firearms are properly stored and secured, especially when your children are in their homes. Oh, you are so right because we may drop our kids off, I don't, you know, and then come back and our child is dead. And I agree, that is part of our Be Smart program. If I can just add to, uh, I agree with, with what everyone has said, um, but speaking from the community perspective as well, where I pastor, I think education is important too. Um, so many that I speak to within our con my congregation as well as the community, they don't have a clear understanding of the, the, the laws and the rules as it relates to gun safety. Um, so panels such as this and panels such as uh, more of my colleagues having conversations within our churches, um, I think is important as well. Um, and those children being a part of that conversation um, to an extent I think is important as well. Uh, l lastly, um, and sorry, uh, again, as, as it's abundantly clear, everybody uh, on this panel uh, takes this matter extremely serious. Uh, Chief White, who, uh, when he heard about this opportunity, was his regret was that he couldn't be here, but this topic is uh, very near and dear to him, as there are too many times that we've gone out since uh, he's taken uh, command of the Detroit Police Department that we've had to respond to these incidents. Um, with youth being a focus on youth, as, as he often indicated, and we can plug right into this panel, you know, the next county prosecutor, the next vice president of Back Bottom Gun Club, the next pastor, the next community advocate, the leader, police chief, deputy police chief, uh, we owe it to that next generation to protect them. Uh, as he has community events such as Walk a Mile Wednesday, when we're out walking the community, he walks with gun locks. Um, each of the 12 precincts uh, in the Detroit Police Department, as well as the public safety headquarters, uh, we have gun locks available. If you'd like one, uh, please come by. We are constantly out there as a campaign that we're uh, trying to acquire as many as we can so that we have them to give out. Uh, in an ideal world in which I'm working very hard uh, to do, officers will have them in their scout cars. So when you encounter an officer, it's, officer may have a gun lock. And right in the community as you see it, you can give, uh, the officers will be able to provide members of this community uh, gun lock. So uh, uh, again, safe storage. Uh, is absolutely paramount. We know that some of the best detectives and investigators on this planet are toddlers. 
They open every drawer, open every cabinet. They find things that you've lost or forgot you've owned. And then they want to know how it works. So when we talk about our youth, we owe it to them to protect them and at times save them from themselves. And uh, gun locks are uh, an extremely valuable tool uh, to help and just see that that happens. Um, I appreciate those responses. I guess as a follow up, you know, we talk about education and training and the importance of education and training. What do you think some important topics, even folks that may have a concealed weapons permit, just misconceptions that they may have, specifically having a, uh, a firearm in the car, maybe engaging with a police officer, things that maybe the community should know that they may not be readily apparent, specifically as it relates to, to carrying uh, a concealed weapon? If I can jump in right there, um, the laws, honestly. Um, <laughs> I'm actually shocked at some of the conversations I have with uh, community and congregants as to what they don't know. I then question who taught them what class they went to as it relates to them being legally able to carry a gun because there's so many laws they don't understand um, or, or aren't knowledgeable about. And then there's um, some of the more common sense stuff that they, they just don't get it. Um, so knowing under, and understanding the law that, uh, of gun safety. <laughs> that absolutely sums it up. Uh, certainly uh, when you have that encounter, uh, a as the licensing process indicates, uh, share with the law enforcement at the very first availability or opportunity that, hey, I am lawfully armed. Uh, and believe it or not, it's value in that because there is a process to obtain that license. To have that license, you've indicated and it's been signed off that uh, you are quote unquote the model citizen. So when we talk about interacting with law and abiding citizens, this is a flag, this is a banner to say, hey, I understand uh, criminality, constitutionality, I, and I am responsible, so it, it is no issue. Tell the officer, I'm legally armed, I have a CPL. Um, if there's an opportunity, uh, turn the lights on in your vehicle so we can see because an officer wants to go home at night. Uh, that's the first thing they want to get out of an encounter. It's not to write a ticket, it's not to get an arrest, it's want to go home and see their family. Uh, so I, I say that to say cut that light on uh, in your vehicle, share, immediately disclose as you can that you are a CPL holder, and at that point be guided by the law enforcement officer that you come in contact with or you're interacting with, and we say, okay, well, where is it, just so you know. Uh, or, okay, it's over there, it's fine, just so that, so you don't have to reach it and grab it and say, hey, I have a CPL, and then reach and pull it out here. That, that, that's a whole different set of circumstances that we hope to avoid. So. Uh, again, the information exchange, the information flow, knowing the laws, knowing the provisions of this uh, concealed pistol license, uh, I think are paramount uh, into safe interaction uh, and enjoying uh, that liberty. So I, I echo the sentiments that have already been discussed, um, but I also like to add that we also, we need to create more spaces like this, um, but we also have to uh, meet people where they are. Um, and so at the Black Bottom Gun Club, we often invite some of our lawyers to come speak to our membership as well as the broader public about firearm laws. Um, there are a lot of laws uh, related to firearms and they are ever changing, so it's important that we stay up to date on those shifts. Um, but also we have boots on the ground events, and so that's when we actually go to the people, where we go to the corners, um, where we under, look at the data and understand where are these issues, where issues of negligent discharges are happening, where are uh, our brothers and sisters being caught up with CCW charges, and we go to the community, we go to the liquor stores, the gas stations, we go to the schools, uh, because it's not enough to have the people come to us, we have to go to the people if we're really serious about addressing these issues. And if I could just add, add to that as well, and I agree with everything that's been said, um, and I do have to go after this this thing. I, I can't even I can't even convince my own children about what I'm about to say. Um, please, the education doesn't come from the internet, internet and social media. Absolutely. Half the Absolutely. stuff you read or more um, on the internet and the newspaper, and I, I like reporters, but it's just false or wrong or misleading or something. And then you have someone who thinks they're educated because they read it on the internet. And like I said, I can't even convince my own children. You know, you know that's probably not true, right? When they, when they come to me, where did you get that information? So any, we, anything that you hear about needs, we need to do better, like everybody says, of getting the real information and the real truth about what the laws are. And maybe people then would not rely so heavily on social media. Now some of the stuff is true, but you know, our children, for example, don't have the, the, the wherewithal to sort between what's true and what's not, and some adults don't either. And so let's just let our children know, our elders, our families know that 
let's get our information from a true and reliable source. Um, yes, I agree with everybody. And I think the, the best way is to get engaged. And I think, um, I would say lately, I have seen more engagement. It looks good on us getting in the community, um, like um, the uh, chief's, deputy chief said, um, Chief White is walking every Wednesday when community engage and then you're able to talk to him and actually ask him questions. And so getting engaged, getting engaged, asking questions, you're getting facts and learning the statistics. Like when I tell people more than 110 people are killed each day due to gun violence and they're like they don't know that information or that blacks are disproportionately impacted due to guy, gun violence and 10 times more likely to die than a white person, they do not know that. So when you get engaged with people in the community that are doing the work, you learn and you get educated. With that being said, I do uh, wanna thank Prosecutor Worthy for sharing her yeah. sentiments. Let's give her a round of applause as she leaves. Thank you, Prosecutor Worthy, we appreciate you. Um, we're talking about gun laws, um, and I want to pivot a little bit to talk a little bit about some of the policy implications. Um, according to the latest scorecard from Giffords Law Center to prevent gun uh, violence, Michigan receives a C grade for the strength of its gun laws. Um, however, gun homicides in Michigan disproportionately affect African American black communities. Um, from 2015 to 2019, the state presented the ninth highest rate of gun homicides of black people across the 50 states. And overall, while black folks represent 15% of the state population, they suffer 79% of gun homicides. Um, it's a true fact when we talk about guns and the implications of that. What can we do as a community specifically to kind of curb gun violence and educate folks on um, how to properly use weapons, and then what do you think is, not necessarily the root cause, but how can we curb this problem in our community? If I can kick us off here, um, I, I think we do need to have the conversation around the root causes. And so many studies have been done, uh, and they consistently show that the root causes of violence uh, and gun violence in our communities are income inequality, poverty, poor, in, in uh, underfunded and inadequate public housing and education, um, as well as lack of opportunities and perceived hopelessness. And so those are the root causes. And I really wanna hone in on the last root cause, lack of opportunities and perceived hopelessness. Uh, I also used to work in the public school system as well. And when you talk to children and some adults, and if you don't think you're going to make it past 25, if you don't think you have to, uh, an opportunity to quote unquote live the American dream, you are much more likely to develop poor impulse control and pull out your firearm when you have a disagreement or you exercise uh, uh, lethal options when you have uh, a, a domestic dispute. And so we really, it's the hard work to address the social issues that are impacting crime in our communities, but it's the work worthwhile. We can't incarcerate ourselves out of this issue. Guns are, guns are a tool. Uh, and so if we are really serious about addressing the issues that we're seeing in our communities, we have to be really serious about laying the foundation to develop, to address the root causes, because if we don't, our grandchildren and their grandchildren will be having these same conversations. I agree you said it. <laughs> you said it so well. Um, what I'll add to that, here in Michigan, one of the biggest reasons we see consistency in gun violence is because Michigan has very weak gun laws. And um, not for lack of trying, the House has passed over 20 plus bills in regards to safe gun storage, um, extreme risk protection, which are red flag laws. They have, um, they've worked so that we wouldn't have guns in the Capitol so that our leaders that serve us feel safe. But the problem is they are held up in the Senate and so they go nowhere. And there are so many states 
that have passed most of these laws, and we know they work because you can see the difference. And so with Michigan, the, the most basic law, secure gun storage, that is the most basic law. 88% of gun owners agree. And we've worked with Gifford. So it's not about the Second Amendment. It's not about taking away anyone's gun rights. I think all of us can agree that it's all about staying safe, saving lives, and making sure, like the deputy said, we all get to go home. You know, as uh, my fellow panelists have indicated, uh, when we talk about uh, stopping this issue that, that's literally plaguing our community, uh, quite frankly, this country, um, better decision making is key. You know, when we talked about conflict resolution and going back to that gun storage, just how simple would that help? when we talk about uh, the decisions that those that don't think that they'll live the American dream or have that option or have a very short window uh, of life expectancy because of their environment was like, well, I'm gonna die anyway, or I'm gonna, you know, it's no sense, what do I have to live for? But just think if there was a firearm in that home where that young person, that young adult uh, may be contemplating uh, addressing a, some type of dispute uh, with violence, with that secured firearm, that eliminates an option. You know, there used to be a day where they would say, you know, well, knuckle up, or, and that's the end of it. Then we go home together, or, 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 you know, we go and play or something like that. But with the availability of firearms, there's finality to that that a lot of people don't realize until after that trigger's been pulled um, that their life is two lives, two sets of families are forever changed. Theirs. Uh, because then they will go in front of Madam Prosecutor, uh, Madam Isom, uh, and, and be held accountable for that. Their family's impacted. You know, it could be a domestic situation. You just killed someone over your, your, your domestic partner, and now you won't get to spend the rest of your life with them anyway. So what were you proving? You know, and not to mention the life that was taken, their family has to adjust and, and deal with that loss and that tragedy. Uh, so uh, again, uh, better decision making, uh, and it's a holistic approach. When we talk about resources, when we talk about, uh, again, broadening the perspective, showing others that there are opportunities available and, and, and that it's not unreasonable to have a lifelong expectancy and, and live out your dream, whatever that may look at. So um, uh, I, again, I echo the sentiments, but through education, through uh, uh, availability, through conflict resolution, uh, I think that's how we get to a place where uh, we can decrease that number of lives being lost due to tragic and just unwarranted gun violence. And just to double back, so it seems like sometimes things get better and then we go for a circle. It's like a cycle. So what is the foundation? And you said a few things that I thought about and we do know it's poverty. Um, I think that the root cause of gun violence is poverty and gun violence is just a symptom. And until we actually address poverty, until people feel safe in the neighborhoods that they live in, because oftentimes you're gonna have young people that have guns and they have no intention of committing a crime. They are trying to feel safe walking to school, walking to the store. How they obtain that gun, we need to find out. We need to know if they are meeting their most basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. As he said, to instill hope. When people feel good about themselves and they feel hopeful and their most basic needs are met, then they're able to focus on education. But if someone's stomach is growling and they're thinking about their safety, they can't focus on education or even mental health, which is a whole other conversation. So people say, well, where will we get the money? If you think about the amount of money we spend on gun violence, which is $16.8 billion a year, <laughs> if we pass just some of the common sense gun laws, which would reduce gun violence, we could use that money to address the systemic part of poverty, not just giving money 
passing out food boxes, which is all good. I've done it. I still do it. But we actually need to focus on the systemic part so that we actually address it, we fix it, and it doesn't occur again. And I think to piggyback on one thing you said as well, uh, and my brother said it as, as well, is um, some of our youth feel as though they have to do what they have to do to survive in the streets or in the community. And so the community partnership um, with police and with other organizations, with the church, I think is important as well. Um, bringing them guys together and young ladies um, and allowing them the opportunity, one, to talk and express themselves and then having that opportunity to then educate. Um, again, I, I can't say it enough, educate them on the laws, on the consequences, um, on the fact that survival doesn't look like walking the streets with a gun because we do have qualified um, law enforcement that protects the streets. So um, building that community engagement and that community trust um, it, it would, would be something else as well. And, and just to wrap uh, this part up here, there's really two parts of this, right? The individual responsibility and the systemic societal policy responsibility as well. Absolutely. Right? And so we have to talk about both. Uh, I think many times when we have conversation around gun violence, it tends to be lopsided. Um, on the individual side of things, right? Because this that's really the low-hanging fruit. That's the easiest part to address, right? We all have individual agency responsibilities um, to do what we need to do to protect ourselves and our community. But when we talk about scale, when we talk about millions of individuals, we have to talk about and address the systems that create the conditions that we see in cities like Detroit. We have to talk about mass incarceration. We have to talk about poverty. We have to talk about uh, poor educational systems because all of these systems create the conditions that we see today. And I know it's difficult, I know it's persistent, but we have to begin this work because if we don't talk about that, if we just talk about individual responsibility, we will continue to have these conversations. Uh, and so it's incumbent upon all of us to really get into the fight as it relates to the policy changes that is gonna be necessary for us to eliminate this issue or, or drastically marginalize them. I appreciate that. You know, not only when we talk about gun violence, individual gun violence. You know, people are dealing with, obviously, mental health issues, specifically uh, domestic violence issues as well uh, within the context of the home. And guns do have an effect on that. Where, folks, where can folks go get more information and, and so that they can um, equip their community around wraparound services and things of that nature, specifically around um, issues? Oh, there, Detroit has so many different organizations that help the community. They have organizations that are boots on the ground. We have organizations that center on mental health. We have organizations that focus on preventing gun violence. But oftentimes you don't see those organizations. As the deputy chief said, our chief of police is walk, walking in a community every Wednesday. Most people don't know that if they're not in the, actually in the community and engaging. So number one, I can give you my um, information and we have resources. So we like to connect with other organizations so we can create a wraparound service. So what we don't have, one of our neighboring organizations have. And and that is how we do the work in the community, and that's how you get help. Thank you for that. Right now, we're gonna open up this portion for a Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions for our panelists. Okay, so uh, my question is, do you think that Michigan will possibly move into other and practice other states where a person can carry a firearm as long as it's unloaded? Because there's a safety issue, just like the guy that was walking around just shooting people randomly. Trying to go to a trunk is not time enough to save my life or somebody else's life that's with me or anybody else around. So the question would be is, do you think that is a possible uh, answer and solution? 
Can you repeat the first portion of your comment, your question around? Do you think that uh, if a person, Michigan's going to move to a point where anybody can carry an unloaded pistol, carry it, transport, have it in the car, et cetera, unrestricted? Yeah, I, I would love for uh, <laughs> Deputy, uh, Deputy Chief to chime in as well. Um, the purpose of carrying a firearm uh, is for self-protection. Uh, and so that we encourage everyone that is eligible and able um, to get their uh, CPL um, so that they are able to uh, carry their firearm on their person as well as in their vehicle. Um, I understand the concern um, that if you don't have your CPL and you are traveling transported and has to be safely stored uh, in the trunk, uh, and that is a barrier um, towards being able to access your firearm in a timely manner. I, I don't foresee um, in the near future Michigan moving forward to a system where that wouldn't be the case, um, but I'm not aware of uh, any uh, legislation on the books that would allow for that anytime soon. Um, keep in mind, I, I'm unaware of anything like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm unaware of anything like that as well. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, a few questions in our Zoom chat. The first question is, can anyone explain how regulating concealment of a weapon is not a violation of the Second Amendment uh, and when, when no stipulations exist in the Constitution? It's, it's quite simple. Um, the Constitution the Constitution has to do with well-regulated militia. It does not guarantee constitutionally that everyone can carry a gun. And most people have misread the Constitution to believe that it speaks to individuals when it does not. It speaks to a well-regulated militia. So it's not a matter of uh, violating the Constitution by saying that you cannot carry a gun. The or additional that, part of that is the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, and so there have been various different interpretations, but as it relates to the Supreme Court um, and legal president, um, that is the president has been set uh, is that individuals, uh, citizens of the United States have the right to keep and bear arms and that right shall not be infringed. And just to really clarify things for this audience is that when we talk about gun control, we also have to talk about uh, really the racist history of gun control um, and how that history was utilized to marginalize and suppress our people. Uh, and so the Black Bottom Gun Club, National African American Gun Association are, are committed to making sure that we do not repeat history and that we continue to exercise the full rights, uh, not only guaranteed to us by the United States Constitution, but the rights guarantee, guaranteed us um, by our Lord, frankly. And the last question in the chat is in regards to the statistics that were shared. Were those statistics based on registered or unregistered gun possessions? Okay. Which statistics? Um, I believe you shared uh, several statistics in regards to um, when people, uh, for in regards to gun violence or when incidents are happening, so are those based on registered or unregistered gun possession? If you're referring to the over 110 people that are killed due to gun violence, that is a combination. That also includes those that are killed um, domestic violence. That includes someone not securing their firearm in a home and their child killed another child or killed the parent. Or that includes someone not securing their firearm in the home and a teenager taking it to school and had there's another mass shooting. So it's a combination of people being killed due to gun violence. It's not one particular thing. Okay, and the last question from the chat, and then I'll turn it back over. Um, as a CPL holder, is it ever accountable, excuse me, is it ever acceptable 
for a police officer to arrest you and put you in the back of the vehicle while they check while they check your CPL and gun for their safety. I I can't speak to uh, that specific set of circumstances. I can tell you that there are times based on uh, the encounter uh, in which uh, an officer makes a decision. It could be perhaps. Uh, the person could be upset and combative uh, when that encounter happens and there's a decision made to separate them from their firearm. Uh, so each scenario uh, is, is different, uh, but there are times where uh, a law enforcement officer make, may make the decision uh, to separate the CPL owner, owner uh, the firearm owner, uh, from their firearm uh, in the interest of, of safety. Um, of themselves and others, an officer could be breaking up a fight, and the aggressor is a CPL holder. To protect the safety of the person who they were fighting with, and possibly the officer. Yes, the officer made uh, uh, remove the firearm from the CPL holder, check its validity, uh, give the person who uh, that CPL owner who may be aggressive an opportunity to kind of uh, cool down and put them in the back of a scout car so they can't hurt anyone or anyone else. So. Uh, again, each counter, uh, encounter is based uh, on its own individual set of circumstances, but in extreme cases, that can be an option that quite it, it is not uh, unlawful. I think that, uh, just a clarifying question, um, in that situation that you just laid out, would that be a request being made by the um, a police officer or a lawful order to remove them from their firearm? Uh, it, it depends. It can be time where it may be a lawful order, and again, that's more in a combative scenario, not just, oh, you have a CPL, get in the back of the car and cuff you, but there there would probably be some mitigating circumstances, but that there are situations, quite frankly, where that could and probably has happened. Okay. I hope that you all will keep track of that question because uh, this early this afternoon, we've got a presenter who is an attorney, practicing attorney in the state of Michigan that's going to talk extensively about criminal law, about constitutional rights, and I can assure you that's one of the questions that's gonna be addressed. Uh, thank you. Um, I too am a, a pastor um, in a congregation, and uh, I am a CPL holder myself, but there are certain individuals that I have allowed in our church to carry um, and I do have a letter that I've signed to document those individuals that I have designated to carry what's inside of our church. If, God forbids, anything happens and that individual that I've designated um, uses their weapon to defend or to stop someone from coming in to harm us, is the church then legally responsible for their actions since we gave the permission for them to carry? I guess it's kind of both of us here. Uh, <laughs> I, I was taught, and my understanding is, as long as we have those letters um, in place legally, um, that we aren't um, held accountable. And I guess that's kind of a gray area, um, so to say, but. Well, I can speak to uh, them possessing it uh, on, uh, in, in your church, in your house of worship. Uh, it's private property. So uh, although there is a blanket statement uh, as it relates to CPLs, there is an opportunity that they can be permissed. Um, there are restaurants that may say um, no firearms allowed on the premises or stores, uh, and people can adhere to that. They can go someplace else, take their business uh, someplace else. But as it relates to houses of worship, uh, if in fact you have allowed that exemption, uh, you are the faith leader uh, and control the decisions made within that house of worship, then that gets the firearm lawfully on the premises. Now, being mindful of the rules of engagement as it relates to utilize that firearm and deploy uh, deadly force, um, that's a different set of circumstances. Um, and as far as liability, certainly there are property uh, uh, laws as it relates to someone being hurt on your venue, uh, on, on the property or the curtilage, um, as well as the criminality that, that could potential that uh, Madam Prosecutor uh, and her team may review 
as to what was done, why is it done, was it constitutionally done or lawfully done, was there probable cause uh, that, that the person did it or was, was within law or they did something improper. So that's a certain, uh, a whole different area uh, post some type of engagement with someone that has a CPL. But to have it and allow it on the property, you are certainly within your right to allow uh, those that you choose. Uh, and again, the documentation uh, is key. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen to get the firearm on there. But post uh, them using it, uh, I can't answer that question because there are so many variables involved. If I may just inject uh, here, I know we've got a distinguished panel. Um, my name is Chewy Correga and I serve as general counsel for the Detroit branch NAACP. And I know that uh, I'm not on the panel, but this question just came up. And it's one that has multi facets to it. I like the answer that the deputy just gave because I think it's accurate. I like the answer uh, that Kofi gave because I think it's accurate. But this is what you must understand. Police officers have every right to carry a weapon, to use it in the course of their work and to defend people. And guess what? When they do, they get sued. They get sued because the question is always a factual question. Was their conduct reasonable under the circumstances? And was it justified? If you're letting people carry a gun on your property, whoever they are, whether you a homeowner, a, a pastor, you got a, a rec room or a community or a bar or whatever, if you got people carrying a gun on your property and you're telling them that it's okay for them to use it in their discretion and their judgment, you better have a lot of insurance. Because if someone gets hurt, somebody gets hurt, the church is going to get sued, the pastor is going to get sued, whoever signed that letter is going to get sued. I'm not saying this to tell you don't do it, but I'm telling you protect yourself. That said, let's give our panelists a round of applause. We thank you for all the knowledge that you guys have presented. Um, at this time, we're going to uh, take a break for attendees to grab lunch, um, and then we're going to return after lunch at what time? In 10 minutes. So we'll return back here in 10 minutes.
excuse me if all presenters can please come to the front of the stage for a group photo. Thank you.
Battery's good. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now? My name is Chewy Correga. I am the general counsel for the Detroit branch NAACP. We've had a great morning today. Please continue to have that wonderful lunch that's being provided as we have a great afternoon in store for you. I hope everybody appreciates the fact that this morning you were able to hear from the source. You listened to the words and the wisdom of the chief, the top prosecuting attorney in the county of Wayne, the Honorable Kim Worthy, who spoke to very candidly about the operation of the prosecutor's office. The, the, the idea behind this Crockett Law School is to demystify things that people hear on the corner, in the barber shop, in the smoke field rooms, et cetera. You can come here and you can get information from the source. You heard an excellent gun panel this morning. And the presentations are going to continue this afternoon. We have an outstanding attorney with us who has been serving for many, many years the Detroit, Wayne County, Michigan area. His name, Jermaine Wyrick. He's going to come to you this afternoon. He's going to talk about an overview of the criminal justice system. And of course, I know many of you cringe when I say criminal and justice in the same sentence. But there's good reason to call it that. He's going to talk to you about all aspects and procedures of criminal law here in the state of Michigan and in particular in the county of Wayne. He's got an extensive resume and background. And by the way, let me just point out to you that each of you should have received a course catalog when you came in this morning. If you haven't, get one before you leave. All of the critical information related to our speakers, their biography and whatnot, is printed here. So I won't go through all of the ins and out and all the information about all these folks. But I do want to tell you that Dwayne Germain is a Detroit native, graduated from the Detroit Urban Lutheran School and Cass Tech, University of Michigan graduate, and a Wayne State University Law School graduate. He's been admitted to practice in law since 1970, pardon me, 1997, practiced all different kinds of law, but today we're going to feature him to come up and talk to you about criminal law and the criminal procedure process. So without further ado, let me have Jermaine Weirich come to you this morning, this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I thank you for being here because I think all of you all that are here, even those that are joining us virtually via Zoom, understand and appreciate the fact that it is vitally important to educate and empower yourselves to know when an individual such as yourself or a family member or friend can face the challenges and crisis of the criminal justice system. Over my 25 year career, one of the things that quite frankly has surprised me most is the number of innocent people that are charged with crimes. Uh, so it's not something that I necessarily shy away from or I, I take great pride in what I do. Um, I used to, you know, early in my career, I remember I used to go to like networking events and things of that nature and I would get this question of, how do you represent those types of people? People are people to me. You know, we all breathe air and we all drink water and we all gonna leave here one day. So, you know, when people to me kind of frown upon uh, the criminal justice system, they're not to me really in touch with the realities of, of, of life or humanity for lack of a better way of saying it. So with that, I know that each and every one of you all are. Uh, so beginning the presentation, we talk about what is not necessarily criminal law, but most of us would drive a vehicle 
have some encounter with or another, what you call traffic law. And one of the pieces of advice that I give, especially when you start talking to young drivers, teenagers, things of that nature, but for anyone, I think that it's important to understand, and it's gonna actually be on one of the other slides. When a vehicle is being driven on any street in the United States or the world for that matter, or at least here, you're required to have three things. You're, inquire, you're required to have your driver's license, you're required to have registration to the vehicle you are driving. And it's important to have that understanding uh, by virtue of the fact that oftentimes people may borrow a vehicle from a parent or, or a sibling or something of that nature, and the only thing they may have is their driver's license. They may not have the registration or proof of insurance to the vehicle they are driving. They have it, and with technology being the way that it is, it's actually easier to have it now because you could actually have it on your phone. So if you're borrowing somebody else's car, the thing that I would advise you to do is have them text the registration and the valid proof of insurance. And that kind of keeps you above board in case there is a police encounter. Uh, the uh, slide that we looked at previously kind of delineates the uh, fines and costs associated uh, with the uh, traffic offenses. Uh, oftentimes what happens when somebody is pulled over for speeding or running a red light or something of that nature is, uh, and to me in, so in somewhat disingenuous faction, fashion rather, uh, the prosecutor, the city attorney will not keep the person as charged to a speeding offense. And the advantage to that is that uh, when the person does not receive a, a speeding offense, let's say for instance, if a six or 10 over the limit or something of that nature, that subjects them to points, which can then adversely affect their driver's license. It, it, because um, if you get points on your driver record, your insurance is gonna go up and we in Detroit all kind of know how uh, insurance is you know, too expensive and things of that nature. So oftentimes, if you do get a, a driver a ticket or a traffic ticket, you can actually have the charge admitted to blockading traffic. And why I said that that's somewhat disingenuous because if you're running a red light or you're speeding or something of that nature and you're quote unquote blockading traffic, it's, it's really the opposite of whatever you were doing. You're not, you're not actually in your vehicle on Grand River or Jefferson or Fourth Street here or something blockading people from getting in the community college, you're actually speeding or something of that nature. And you actually pay a higher fine with that. Generally, you pay about 100, and actually down here it says, the current rate is $175 at uh, 36th District Court. So um, just to kind of educate you in terms of how the uh, traffic laws go, one of the things that I always advise people to do, I had to advise myself to do this a few months ago when I was literally pulled over uh, in a suburban community and it was a situation where the officer wrongfully, I said that I actually ran a blinking red light and when you encounter any type of red light, your obligation is to make sure that your tires are completely stopped for at least three seconds. So I knew that I did that. But this officer, and oftentimes, unfortunately, the realities, and you know, we're here at the Crockett Community Law School, so there's a certain social justice uh, perspective here. Oftentimes, officers have what you call quotas, uh, whereby you know, they're supposed to stop a certain number of people uh, within an hour. Some, some suburban communities, even those you know, right off of Eight Mile, are known to have quotas where they're supposed to stop at least three cars an hour, and they make a lot of money, and if you go to their nice, courthouses, they have nice courthouses that they've made a lot of money uh, engaging in this type of behavior. But so long story short, the thing that I always encourage people to do, whether you're right or whether you're wrong, uh, unless, you know, you just don't really care financially about the repercussions of it, I always advise people to make a court date. Because if you make a court date, you put the onus on that officer, even via Zoom, not because the, the irony think about my situation, this uh, ticket was handled on Zoom. You put the officer in the situation where they have to show up to meet that burden of proof that you actually committed whatever infraction. Now in my instance, I know I didn't, not to say that I've never sped or anything in that nature, but in this particular instance, I know that I ad adhere to the law. So you put the officer, you put the pressure on an officer to more or less 
show up at least. And in my instance, most recently, this was literally about two or three months ago, the officer didn't show up for the Zoom here and so it was dismissed anyway. So I'm saying that to say, even if you're completely in the wrong, even if you're speeding or something of that nature, I could even tell old war story. And as I remember, when I was extremely young, I was about 18 years old, um, me and my mom were driving back. It was like a little family uh, a trip, road trip to Chicago for the weekend. And, you know, I was about 16, 17 years old, and she fell asleep in the car. And me being a typical teenager, you know, it's like, mom fell asleep. I'm behind the wheel of this vehicle on I-94. The more she fell asleep, the faster that I went. Literally, I got pulled over by a police officer. This is, if, if you're familiar with the western part of the state, it's probably around like the Kalamazoo area coming back from Chicago on I-94. And this you can say, police officer pulled me over. And, you know, as we're pulling over, she's kind of starting to wake up. Now, nice police officer. And uh, he pulls uh, me over and like, you know why I'm pulling you over? Like, yeah, because, I mean, I was probably going about 100. I'll be very honest with you. About <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not anybody's past. I'm not professing to be a saint. I was probably going about 100. And she woke up kind of like, hey, what's going on here? You know, things of that nature. And he said, ma'am, you know, your son was speeding. I, I clocked him at going. I think I was literally... If I wasn't at 100, I was pretty near. I was probably past 90, okay? And uh, he said, I clocked your son going about 90 miles per hour, but he seems like a nice, it, I think this kind of emphasizes another point too. When you get pulled over, even if the police officer is completely wrong, always be very nice and polite and respectful to the officer. You're not gonna win any battle with a police officer on the scene, even if he's completely jerk and he's completely wrong. Hire an attorney or, or have your battle in the courtroom. Don't have it on the scene. We've seen too many tragic situations uh, in recent years where that turns out the wrong way. Uh, but so I say all of that to say I was, you know, relatively nice, polite, respectful. When she woke up, she was nice, polite, respectful. An officer gave us a break. He was like, ma'am, I know your insurance is going to go up sky high if I give this young man a speeding ticket for what he was doing, so I'm going to give him a break. And, you know, there was no repercussions from that. Um, so I say that to say... Uh, make your court date uh, if you get a court date, but also, you know, on the scene, try to, one of the terminologies that you hear within uh, police culture or police training is escalation and de-escalation. And, and simply what that means is the notion that uh, if you have a police encounter, you as a citizen, but even on the other end from the standpoint of the police, you want to try to minimize the problem or the damage that comes from that encounter. You don't want a situation whereby, you, you know, using the terminology, you make a mountain into a molehill, you, you end up shooting some unarmed citizen that, you know, isn't armed or anything in that nature. So, but that kind of requires both um, parties to, to remain calm. Uh, quite frankly, you know, kind of telling some of our other flaws. In this particular instance, recently where um, the officer pulled me over and said, I didn't stop. Quite frankly, I, I, I kind of got a little indignant. I'm like, what do you mean I didn't stop? You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm an attorney. I'll see you in court. I'm saying that to say, don't engage in that type of behavior. Don't have an ego or, 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 or get mouthy with the police officer or anything of that nature. Just keep it calm. Keep it cool. Less is more. Keep it quiet. Uh, and we'll kind of even get into some of that a little later as well. So we can move. I think beyond the traffic, uh, and kind of talk to, as, as it relates to the criminal aspect of my presentation, I kind of want to talk about it really in two different ways. These first two slides will kind of be what I call the overview of the criminal justice system, which means it talks about the procedures of the criminal justice system. And in the latter slides, we'll talk about what the substance of the law is, what we've even heard this morning and already discussed is constitutional rights and things of that nature as it relates to the police. So the actual overview, can we go back to that first slide, please? Thank you. Um, it's important to understand that the uh, criminal justice process, especially when a person is charged with a felony, begins with what you call an arraignment on the warrant. And that's basically the first court here, and oftentimes that person hasn't met their attorney yet, and by met their attorney, unless they actually privately hire an attorney, Typically, they're not even appointed an attorney at that stage of the process, although one of my other pieces of advice, if 
you or someone you love or care about is in trouble, it's best to consult with an attorney as soon as possible in that process so that person can begin to assist you. But the arraignment on a warrant, the purpose of that, they're probably doing one right now, 36 district court as we speak. The purpose of the arraignment on the warrant is basically to tell the person what the charges are against them and to also set a bond. And when buying a set, one of the things that it is important, and this is to me why it's important to even have an attorney, is that the judge will assess what the factual allegations are in a police report, you know, how serious the crime is or how minor the crime is, things of that nature. But when you're making what you call a bond argument in that instance, to me, you need to present the person in the most positive light that you could present the person. And by that I mean, just because they may have quote unquote made some type of mistake allegedly of violating the law or something of that nature doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have good positive attributes that to me should be completely flushed out. So you wanna talk about their educational background. You may wanna talk about if they're a responsible, loving father. You wanna talk about if they've had stable employment, if they've been you know, a resident of Detroit all of their lives or anything of that nature. You really wanna kinda flush out their positive attributes. Going toward the uh, relatively middle part of the page, the pre-examination here is actually a relatively new creation. And the purpose of the pre-examination hearing is basically if the person has not retained their own attorney, uh, the person at that point would meet whoever their court appointed attorney is, and then it would be a, make a determination made in terms of whether or not that person actually has what you call the discovery in the case. Discovery is basically the police reports or any other type of evidence, uh, with technology being the way that it is, even the Detroit Police Department by federal consent order is required for police officers to be equipped with uh, body cam video and dash cam video. So that type of uh, material in addition to the police reports, any witness statements, uh, pictures, things of that nature, fall within discovery. So the purpose of the pre-exam is if you don't have the discovery, your attorney is supposed to tell the judge and the prosecutor, hey, I don't have it, I need it. And where that uh, becomes very important is that the next stage of the process is what you call the preliminary examination, which a person has the right, the statutory right to have within 14 days for what you call the arraignment on a warrant, although COVID has kind of thrown a lot of that off, quite frankly, from a, a practical standpoint. But uh, the purpose of the preliminary examination, which I think is now our next slide, the top of our next slide, is to determine whether or not there's probable cause, which is a legal term, to believe a crime was committed. Probable cause means under the facts and circumstances, a reasonable person would believe a crime was committed. There are different legal standards of proof under the law. There's a standard of proof in civil cases called a preponderance of the evidence. There's a standard of proof in uh, criminal cases beyond a reasonable doubt that we'll talk about later, which is the highest standard of proof under the law. And the reason for that is that our time is really considered to be really the most precious, valuable thing that we have in life. Uh, as important as people put, or as much of a premium as people put on money, it could be replenished, it could be replaced. If someone is wrongfully convicted of a crime and they go to prison for several years or several decades of their lives, that can't be replaced, even if they file some quote unquote big lawsuit to try to be, I compensated for it, that in and of, of itself cannot be replaced. Uh, so from the preliminary examination, that low requirement in most instances requires the uh, person to actually go to circuit court, which is considered the trial court. From there, there are a few uh, pretrial conferences held. There are actually uh, some motions that could be filed. And then I think going to the next slide from here, uh, a trial is held. There are two types of trials. There's a, a bench trial, which where the judge makes the decision. Uh, and there's also a jury trial, which is always my favorite, which where you bring into me what you call the conscience of the community, the law abiding citizens to make that, that decision, which is what I always favor, all due respect uh, to the judiciary. In fact, I had a client last week that told me he wanted to have a bench trial because of a favorable ruling that the uh, judge made on his uh, co defendant's case and it kind of made me a little nervous. I'm like, I'm almost, I'm not really used to that. So, you know, it is what it is. But I mean, you really have to kind of honestly assess the facts and circumstances of your own individual case uh, when you make like informed decisions and, and exercise good judgment uh, with the advice of counsel. 
So moving on to the uh, next slide. We can move past the path there. Okay, so, and, and I talked about this a few minutes ago, but I'll, I'll kind of talk about it more. Um, the information is basically the written documentation of the charges that are against an individual in the criminal justice system. And the information is supposed to delineate very specifically what the person is charged with, what the elements of a particular crime are, and if there's any type of maximum penalty or minimum penalty, uh, even kind of piggyback in a conversation from this morning, one of the more significant charges that you see in you know, our urban community, Detroit, levied against uh, individuals facing criminal charges is a charge called felony firearm. And it, uh, is, it accompanies other charges such as carrying a concealed weapon or, or something of that nature. But what is important to understand and the seriousness of felony firearm is that it's what you call a mandatory minimum offense. And by mandatory minimum offense, if an individual is convicted of felony firearm, it carries a mandatory minimum of two years in prison. Uh, so it kind of makes the, the work of someone such as myself, the attorney, a little bit more difficult because, of course, when a person comes to me and they want, want to hire me, they hire me with the goal of not going to jail or prison, whereas a felony firearm doesn't even give the judge any discretion like a judge that uh, is actually sentencing someone that either pleads guilty to felony firearm or is found guilty after a trial has to send that person away to prison for two years. In addition, and this is what you call um, con concurrent, I mean consecutive, excuse me, meaning that it's in addition to whatever time that that individual receives on the other charge. So if they get probation or any other time on a different charge, that two years in a, is in addition to that. Uh, so we can move on from information. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite uh, words in the uh, criminal justice system or, or standards, and we talked about it a few minutes ago, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It's, the, my slide actually comes directly from the jury instruction on that. As I stated a few minutes ago, reasonable doubt is the highest standard of proof under the law. Uh, and one of the examples I'll even give of that for those of you all who are old enough to remember this, uh, back in the 1990s, you had the O.J. Simpson uh, criminal case, which you know a lot of people felt uh, very strongly about one way or the other. And um, O.J. was actually acquitted in the criminal case, but then the families of the uh, individuals that were killed, his ex-wife and the young man that was killed, turned around and sued O.J. successfully in a civil case. And a lot of people didn't understand that, like that didn't really make common sense to them. Like, how could you sue O.J. in a civil case, but he won his criminal case? And the real reason is because of the different burdens of proof. The beyond a reasonable doubt burden of proof is such a high burden of proof because we value our freedom, we value our liberty, things of that nature, that it's the highest burden of proof under the law. It basically, you know, if we even had to quantify it by a percentage, it's probably 90% or more, whereby the standard of proof in a civil case, preponderance of the evidence, which is the lawsuit that was actually filed, was only about a 51%. So it kind of is like more likely than that. Maybe he did it, but it's not as high of a burden of proof. So as the uh, slide said, a reasonable doubt is a fair and honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It is not an imaginary or possible doubt, and I would kind of pause there for a minute. So it's not one of the terms you might hear. It's not a figment of imagination. You know, you can't, to me, insult the intelligence of a jury if you're charged with a crime. You have to go on to the next line, appeal to their reason and common sense. Not to the next slide, I'm sorry. Could we go back? Yeah. Uh, you have to appeal to their reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a, a doubt that is reasonable after a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of the case. So now we could go to the next slide. Right to counsel is very important. Um, as Attorney Correga said this morning, many of the rights uh, in our justice system are associated with the Constitution. So the right to counsel is actually straight from the Sixth Amendment. Uh, it was actually expanded in 1963 in a case called Gideon versus Rainwright 
which basically says if a person is poor and they can't afford to hire their own attorney, the court is obligated under the Sixth Amendment to actually appoint an attorney for them. Uh, one of the other cases, and this is alluded to at the bottom of the slide, that you really hear in our, our popular culture is Miranda. It's like one of the most popular uh, legal cases ever. In fact, oftentimes when uh, individuals hire myself, one of the first things they tell me is that the police didn't read my, my quote unquote Miranda rights. And Miranda, as you may have heard, if you watch any of these uh, criminal shows, which quite frankly, I don't watch any of them, but if you watch them uh, or, or even see movies, Miranda is basically when a person is being arrested, they're being handcuffed, when the police officer tells them that they had a right to remain silent and they had the right to an attorney and that anything that they say can be used and held against them in a court of law. It's important to understand, and, and if you don't take anything else away from my uh, presentation today, I hope you take this away. It's very important to understand, I think the most important part of Miranda or any of your constitutional rights associated with the criminal justice system is the right to remain silent. Oftentimes, I see cases where an individual could have perhaps won their case because their case could not have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt based upon all the other evidence that the police may have, and they basically shot themselves in the foot, for lack of a better way of saying it, because they confessed or they admitted to something because they're a nice person and, and they want to uh, tell this nice police officer because they figured this nice police officer is going to help them and when in actuality that person putting the handcuffs on you are not putting handcuffs on you because they're trying to make a new friend. So the thing that I always just emphasize the first time I get a call from anybody in my office is that if you can just tell them I don't want to say anything other than through my attorney, his name is Jermaine Wyrick, this is his cell phone number, call him. That's really, like I said, if you don't take anything else away from it, please take that. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. The uh, right to a jury, like I said, I love jury trials. Um, in our criminal justice system, the felony jury trials, if you go over to Frank Murphy, uh, you basically have 14 jurors that are basically what you call in panels. Uh, which means 14 jurors actually hear the case. When it's time for the jury to deliberate, which means the jury reaches a decision, they're narrowed to 12. If you're in misdemeanor court, such as 36 district court, there's actually six jurors, like if you're charged with operating while impaired or some type of misdemeanor, it's six jurors, and they eliminate one of them and it's down to five. The most important part of the process in a criminal case to me is how you select the jury. And to me, that's vitally important because everyone, and there actually is going to be a slide later about this, is entitled to what you call a fair and impartial jury. So the only way that you can receive a fair and impartial jury if you are uh, accused of a crime is to make sure that that jury is what you call vetted, interviewed. You, you know, you, one of the things that, quite frankly, I don't like uh, at this point that I've kind of seen evolve over the years of my practice is that in some instances, judges are kind of doing most of the voir dire and kind of taking that interaction away from the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And I think it's very important, and I've even filed motions on this, for you to get to know that jury as well as you can because they're bringing life experiences to the table. Even if they tell you they're not biased, they, they have some biases about something. So you need to really make sure that your jury is fair. And one of the protections afforded, and this is not on the slide, but it's an important case. You may even want to write it down. The United States Supreme Court decided a case a while ago called the Batson case, which basically says that a jury cannot be full, cannot be actually selected uh, in a racially biased manner, meaning that in the instance of a criminal case, the prosecutor can't kick off jurors because they're black, because they're African American especially if the uh, uh, defendant is African-American. And, you know, even the interesting dynamic about that, and I'm trying not to tell too many war stories, is that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the serious cases I tried before the pandemic um, involved a situation where the prosecutor was doing that. And it was right, you know, here in Detroit, right over at Frank Murphy. So I made an objection that he was, you know, kicking jurors off. And, and jurors can be, 
picked off uh, of a panel, you know, for what you call for cause. So say, for instance, if you've been a victim of a crime, if it's a rape case and you've been raped, of course, you can't really set aside that traumatic experience and be fair. Um, but getting past that, you can't kick people, you use what you call peremptory challenges. A prosecutor can't dismiss jurors for, they have to dismiss jurors for what you call racially neutral reasons under the Batson case, which is a United States Supreme Court case. The case here that I, I discussed, the Bryan case, is actually a Michigan uh, Supreme Court case from 2012 uh, where a gentleman said that um, he believed that African Americans were being excluded. So um, the good news behind all of that is that there are cases to ensure that a jury is uh, diverse. Uh, there has even been, quite ironically, even after the O.J. Simpson case, there was a, a dynamic in changing it uh, with the use of call recorders court of Frank Murphy and us, Wayne County Circuit Court, uh, things of that nature. But the juries, you know, are, you know, we're kind of pulling through this pandemic starting to look good again. And even before the pandemic, they were. So we could go to the next slide now. Right to Bill. We talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but one of the uh, most important things to understand about that is that judges have, judges, although some are appointed by the governor, uh, and we're talking about state judges here. Um, they're always concerned about being elected or reelected. And, and by that, I mean, if you have an individual even charged with a misdemeanor such as drunk driving, their concern is that they never want to make the news because that individual charged with drunk driver was treated leniently or given a bind by a judge and then they go out and they kill somebody or do something really terrible uh, the next time around. So. When you're making a bond argument to a judge, you have to, as I said a few minutes ago, really present the person in the best light possible. And to me, you really have to kind of have a grasp or control of the situation whereby if a person has actually engaged in the behavior that they're accused of, you have to present them in a way that they're trying to themselves take some type of proactive or meaningful steps to assure the judge that, look, judge, I'm not going to be that horror story or that nightmare a case for you. So in the case of a drunk driving, you should get into A or something of that nature before a judge makes you do that type of uh, thing. Uh, some of the other uh, protections or one of the more other more important things to understand about bond as well is that a magistrate, um, which is not a full-fledged judge, but also handles uh, bond situations at the arraignment on a warrant uh, can impose certain conditions or a judge can impose certain conditions which I mentioned here, uh, especially for young people or y anyone. Uh, a tether can be imposed, a curfew can be imposed. Uh, if it's a case involving drug or alcohol use, that can be imposed or suspected drug or alcohol use. Uh, this is a wonderful thing as the slide says, uh, under the Eighth Amendment, the bond cannot be excessive. And I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about the Eighth Amendment today, but I have been using that a lot since the pandemic because it protects individuals against cruel and unusual punishment. So because of COVID and because of the disasters that we heard about in the Wayne County Jail about COVID, one of the arguments that I've been making creatively is that we shouldn't subject individuals to cruel and unusual punishment by putting them in a jail um, and subjecting them to to possibly dying uh, from COVID. But the less serious the case that is involved with that, the better that that argument could be made. This, you know, if you go out, God forbid, and kill somebody or rob somebody, carjack, that argument still isn't going to fly that much. Um, there's also a case, as we've seen bill reform, uh, especially beginning now with 36 District Court uh, leading the way. Uh, the concept of an individual being penalized or not being able to post bond or bill because they're indigent or poor is not a new concept. As the slide reflects, way back in 1956, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called Griffin versus Illinois, where one of my favorite terms here, equal justice, there can be no equal justice when the kind of trial a man gets depends upon the type of money that he has. A little bit more recently than that, in 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a case called Salerno, which basically says that you have a substantive right 
uh, due process rights to liberty and things of that nature unless in some way or another you're a flight risk or a danger to others and by danger to others if you've committed some type of uh, serious or assaultive type case. So we can move on to the next slide. Police misconduct um, is, is a very serious issue. As the statistics act, I put an article here uh, that was written by a lady, Denise Hurd, uh, from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where it says each year the United States police kill about 1,000 people, uh, which equals to about 88 percent, excuse me, of homicides for adult men. The group risk is greater for black men who are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than white men. Another statistic that I even uh, saw last night based upon NPR radio, they did an investigation where 135 unarmed blacks, and that includes women, have been killed since 2015. So that's a very serious situation. It's a very uh, grave situation. That's a very tragic situation. But the standard that is used, and this is actually uh, the case that I uh, have delineated here, uh, is a United States Supreme Court case from 1989 that talks about objective reasonableness. And basically, when an officer has, is alleged to have engaged in excessive force, their, the assessment or the decisions that would be made in a, a criminal court or even a civil lawsuit or anything in that nature would be whether or not the actions of that officer were objectively reasonable, which means how would the average ordinary officer presented with the same situation act in that circumstance. It's not about what is quote unquote subjectively unreasonable. I'll tell you another war story going back to my youth. Um, I had a situation and, and we're gonna get into I think maybe the next slide talking about driving while black. And I think we could even go to that because it kind of segues right into it. But it's still kind of talking about that objective reasonable. It can't be based upon what the subjective intent of the officer is, and by this I mean this. In these situations, these tragedies where we've seen unarmed men killed, an officer can't think just because someone is a black male or female, for that matter, that they're dangerous and that that officer is entitled to be trigger happy. The only way that uh, any individual, us as citizens or police officers, is supposed to use lethal force as if they are actually met with lethal force. I remember one of the first cases I ever won uh, was a situation here in Detroit where uh, an officer literally fired at my uh, client who was driving a car kind of like away from the officer. And the officer's contention was that my client was going to run him over, but when we really assessed the situation, the officer was standing in a position where the, the guy's car wasn't going to run him over. But that was his pretextual, arbitrary way of trying to justify shooting into the car. So I'm saying that to say an officer cannot act based upon fear alone or, or paranoia or anything of that nature. They have to act based objectively based upon what's reasonable. Like we are, you know, for any of us that may be CPL holders, we can't just, you know, walk around with the firearm, as, as the panel discussed extensively earlier, and say, well, because I think that person might hurt me, you just shoot them. I mean, that's not right. So officers are kind of held to that same objective uh, standard. And my driving while black story, I probably told this story 20 years ago when I first spoke here uh, at Crockett Community Law School, but it's something, I mean, when you're, when you are racially pro profiled by the police, it's an experience you never forget. I remember I was around 19 years old. My buddy, who was the slowest driving young man, he was completely opposite from me, never would have been driving anywhere near 100 miles an hour on I-94. Uh, he drove so slow that, I don't know if you've ever been in a car, like the passenger seat of a car with somebody, and they're driving so slow that you're like literally on your side looking to see if there's an accelerator. You can press like, is there, any, is there anything I can do on my side? to make this car go fast. He literally drove that slow. But when we were in the undergrad, he had a car I didn't, so I would ride with him all the time. And I remember this was in Ann Arbor, actually Ypsilanti. We went to a bowling alley. We was undergrad in Ann Arbor, but we went to a bowling alley in Ypsilanti on Wasserman, which is the main street that goes between Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. And I never will forget, we, he was driving, and we pulled out, as he always did, very slowly from the bowling alley 
up to not even like a block. Like he pulled literally like from where I'm standing, probably not to like where the food is, was like where the intersection was, out of the bowling alley parking lot. And stopped at the light where, like I said, maybe the food table was. And, and like I said, in his usual fashion, pulled very slowly to the intersection of light. And the next thing I know, whoop, you know, it's, it's a siren going off behind us. And he's clueless, I'm clueless, like, what in the world? Why are we being pulled over? Police officer tells us, you were speeding. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, no way in the world Oliver's speeding. It's like, <laughs> Oliver wouldn't speed. And like, I wish he would speed. Like, no, no way in the world. And so I'm saying that to say most of us that have lived lives as black men have had those type of encounters in some way or another. You know, fortunately, we were fortunate enough to survive it. And, you know, I think... I don't remember exactly what happened. I don't even think he gave us a ticket. He just, to me, saw two young black guys coming out of a bowling alley and said, well, let me pick with them for a minute, you know. Um, so I'm saying that to say you have to be cautious. One of the things that's not on my slide, and if you have a pen, you may want to take a note of this. There's a 1996 case called Wren versus the United States, which is kind of like a case that, to me, at least protects us and driving while black uh, situations. Is, uh, if you take sites, it's 517 U.S. 806, 1996 from the United States Supreme Court. And it involved a black male that was, quote unquote, in a high crime area in Washington, D.C. Uh, the police alleged that he turned without signaling. He said that that was pretextual, arbitrary, not true, that he did signal. And they were just making that up as an excuse to pull him over. And when they pulled over his vehicle, they found crack cocaine. So when he went to court, he tried to argue that the fruits that they found, the uh, crack cocaine that they found, should be suppressed because it violated his Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. And what the uh, Supreme Court decided there is that although, uh, as the slides are, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the slide up. Um, the Fourth Amendment requires probable cause. The definition of probable cause means under the facts and circumstances, a reasonable person would believe a crime was committed. Uh, even if the stop was quote unquote pretextual, as long as there was probable cause, they could pull him over. But the good part, this is the good news of the case, and pay very careful attention to that. The Supreme Court did say in this case, the selective enforcement of the traffic code based upon race is inconsistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So that's kind of like the good news that comes from the driving while black. Uh, from my Michigan Supreme Court, and this is kind of what I call hot off the press, uh, there was a decision made, Grand Rapids Police Department over in our, the western part of our state had a practice whereby they would fingerprint individuals, although it's a lot, and we'll talk about Maryland versus King in a few minutes, by a US Supreme Court case, once somebody is arrested or accused of a crime, they have some type of a device where they will pull people over and fingerprint them, which is overreaching and overzealous. So fortunately, the Michigan Supreme Court said that fingerprinting an individual without probable cause, a warrant, or an applicable exception violates the Fourth Amendment rights. So that's actually a good case in the area of what you call driving while black. We could go on to the next slide. Search and seizures, we've already started talking about this a little bit. Uh, searches in general because of the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures because of a theory that you may hear in the law called the Castle Doctrine where we have a reasonable expectation of privacy in our home and things of that nature are per se unreasonable unless there is a warrant. Now there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, exigent circumstances which is considered to be an emergency. If the, if the house is on fire, if they think somebody in the house is about to get shot or raped or, or something very, very serious, uh, then they don't necessarily need a warrant to go into that house. Uh, one of the things that I commonly see in my practice that's an exception to the warrant requirement is what I call consent. And here's what I mean by consent. The police are looking for Joe Blow, and they go to Joe Blow's home, Joe Blow's mom or Joe Blow's girlfriend is home, Joe Blow is not at home. And they knock on the door in a very friendly manner, you know, ma'am, Mrs. Blow, we're looking for Joe Blow. Uh, is he home? No, he's not home. Well, can we come in and, and talk to you? At that point, 
the lady, the mom, the girlfriend, wife, whoever, can say no because of the reasonable expectation of privacy we have afforded by the Fourth Amendment in our homes. But oftentimes, because you have nice police officer, you have nice lady, nice lady says, come on in. And in some instances, Joe Blow is home. In some instances, Joe Blow has a firearm or contraband in the home that, quite frankly, the police would not have found but for the consent to enter. So that's important to understand. And one of the uh, more important cases as well that's mentioned on the slide, I'm sorry the slide is so small, but uh, you have a handout as well, you should read it. Uh, that really speaks to that reasonable expectation of privacy is a landmark case called Terry versus Ohio. Out of actually uh, downtown Cleveland, Ohio, was in the late 60s, 1968, which basically says when a police officer approaches us as citizens, they have to have a reasonable and articulable suspicion that in some way or another, there's some type of criminal activity afoot. So I'm saying that to say the reason, going back to my war story from when I was an undergrad, the officer said that we were speeding even though we were not because the officer knew that he couldn't just pull us over because we were black. He had to give some type of reasonable and articulable suspicion. That case here versus Ohio was a, a case whereby a, a, a young man was walking up and down the street, like basically a commercial street where there's like retail and stores and things of that nature. And the police thought that he was casing one of the jewelry stores or something of that nature. So the reasonable and articulable suspicion was that he was quote unquote casing a, a jewelry store. Um, that even came from the uh, Cass case in 1967. Uh, what's also important to understand and what's in the middle of the outline as well is that there's an automobile exception that is very old at this point. It goes back to 1925 case in the handout there called Carroll, which basically says that the police do not have to have a search warrant to search an automobile due to what you call the transitory nature of the automobile. Unlike a house, you could drive or you can move an automobile so they don't necessarily uh, need a search warrant to search the automobile. Uh, search warrants also apply to things such as blood draws, which means if a person is suspected of drunk driving and they refuse to give a preliminary breath test, the uh, police can actually go and find a magistrate or a judge to sign off on a search warrant that they suspect this person is uh, uh, intoxicated. Uh, in the case, as mentioned there, the Missouri versus Neely case, there's also a case there called Riley versus California that also allows search, uh, search warrants for cell phones because oftentimes, unfortunately, young people or anybody, uh, we've even seen some older distinguished people get caught up like this, are not necessarily that cautious in terms of what they put on a cell phone. And oftentimes, they, if the police have no other evidence, they find evidence on a cell phone of what uh, an individual has done. I alluded to Maryland versus King a few minutes ago. What's important to understand about that, uh, and it doesn't contradict the Johnson case that I just mentioned, a, a relatively new case from the Michigan Supreme Court in 2022, but it does afford the police the opportunity to take your fingerprints, to take DNA, especially if it's a serious case. Uh, they, they're mandated by statute to take DNA, or photos of mug shots once a person is arrested. The beautiful thing about that, though, if a person is acquitted or exonerated, uh, at the end of the case successfully, you can actually ask that your fingerprint be returned so they understand in the police database. Another case uh, that's actually not in the handouts as well that you may want to write for that reason, or if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to share any of this with you. Uh, Collins versus Virginia involves uh, a motor vehicle, but a little bit different from a car. It involves a motorcycle. And basically what the Collins case said involves a motorcycle that the police suspected that was stolen uh, based upon a Facebook photo. So basically what the police more or less tried to do was basically see this, this uh, motorcycle that was under the tarp next door to a home. And the uh, uh, Supreme Court decided this was a 2018 case under those circumstances. The, the motorcycle was parked. It wasn't transitory or anything of that nature. So because it was essentially almost like part of the home where it was parked and things of that nature, that law enforcement would have to get a, um, a search warrant. Another case, I try to give you all the favorable cases, like if anyone's accused of a crime or needs it. Uh, from 2007, there's a case called Brindlin versus uh, California. This isn't on the handout either, which uh, 
And what's important to understand about these constitutional rights, we talk about the Fourth Amendment and things of that nature, is that um, the, the Fourth Amendment protects you as an individual. It doesn't necessarily protect your home or your car or whatever else that may be a product of that search. So I'm saying that to say in my instance where, you know, telling my old war story from years ago, um, when the police said that Oliver was, was, was speeding and he even asked me for my ID, and this was, you know, at least five, six years before I became an attorney, I'm like, why are you asking for my ID? They do that because they figure if they can catch big fish, like, hey, even if this person isn't driving, but he might have a, an illegal firearm or he might have drugs on his person, here we didn't pull somebody over for really an unconstitutionally, racially biased reason, but we didn't caught this kid that's been selling drugs or has a firearm that might be going to pose a danger to the community. But the beautiful part about the Constitution, or at least the Sprinkler case that I allude to, is that the passenger can, t can contest to the fruits of the poisonous tree, meaning if the search is illegal, if, if they find something illegal, and a judge finds that it was an illegal search, the passenger, in my instance, the per I as a person not driving, could have contested the, that, that evidence be suppressed. Uh, another very important case that's not in the uh, uh, materials as well, it's called Arizona versus Gantt. You may even want to write this down. And it involves a search incident to an arrest, meaning that when a person is actually arrested, uh, the extent to which the police can search them or their vehicle. Uh, Mr. Gant was in a situation where he was arrested and actually in the, the police car handcuffed and then they searched his vehicle afterwards. The court found that that was improper because really when a police officer or law enforcement conducts a search incident to an arrest, it should be, according to the Gant case, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 2009, limited to the scope of what the danger is. So if a person is handcuffed in the back seat of the police car already, they're not about to reach for a firearm that could be pose a deadly force to the police officer or you're supposed to search for, if you think that there's anything illegal in the car, you're supposed to search before uh, that part of the process, which is beautiful. There's also a really good case that comes from what you call the Sixth Circuit Court, which is the court I uh, hear within the Midwest area that we live in, Michigan, Ohio, and about three or four other states from 2014, it says the law requires, it's called U.S. versus Noble, an individualized suspicion of a person who is to be frisked, not a general suspicion that the vehicle was armed. So the beautiful part about that is that you have situations where um, you may have seen, you know, even on, you know, TV or Boys in Hood or something like that, where Everybody's out of the car and they spread eagle and they're searching everybody. The beautiful thing about the Gantt case and some of the more progressive cases is that now the suspicion is supposed to be more individualized versus you in this car and there might be a gun and there might be drugs, so everybody got to go to jail type thing. Uh, kind of starting to wrap up my presentation, uh, the expungement laws, can we go to expungement, uh, was actually expanded last year to where now a person can have up to three felonies and receive an expungement. Serious cases still cannot be expunged. Those that carry life offenses such as murder, uh, armed robbery, rape, things of those natures cannot be expunged. But cases, some minor assaultive cases or some that uh, require up to 10 years in prison can be. There's even a one bad night uh, aspect to expungement, meaning that a person could technically have four felonies, but if more than one felony happened within a 24-hour period, it could still be counted as one, even though it's more than uh, the, the threshold requirement. At least five years have passed. There's a, a new law uh, that even allows DUI expungements that actually just took effect this year. Uh, you all talked a lot. The next slide is about firearm. Uh, one of the things that's pretty resolute, and this was actually decided by the Supreme Court this year, uh, but it's the Supreme Court has been pretty consistent on this, is that Americans have a right to carry firearms in public for self-defense. And that's, in large part, I believe, because of the clout, the influence that the National Rifle Association and things of that nature have. Uh, as the discussion that I uh, advised earlier that I, I strongly advise, uh, if you are a licensed CPL holder and you don't want problems, because I have had a lot of 
nice, decent, law-abiding citizens who do want to protect themselves, even get in trouble for uh, carrying a weapon, even those that are licensed. Just keep it in the trunk of the car if you can, um, and, and you save yourself a lot of problems. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I'm thank you, Jermaine. And we want to know uh, whether any of you have any questions for Attorney Weirich. That uh, case about Arizona versus Gant. That was in 2009. Thank you. It was a U.S. Supreme Court case. Any other questions? Yes. One minute. A question. Um, so I had asked a question in the last segment via Zoom, but my question wasn't answered effectively, so I came to here myself. Um, <laughs> and... And and the guy left, the um the deputy chief left, so I catch him down the road. Um, however, my question I had talked about being pulled over as a CPL holder and then placed in the back of a police car. Um, he said he needed to know the ramifications. I, I missed the fact that it was doing a traffic stop. The reason for the traffic stop was um, my tags was like I say ten days expired during the pandemic, and um, upon me getting pulled over, you know, the, the tax was bought. I told him I'm a CPL holder. My my pistol is on my right side. Um, get out the car, get out the car, get out the car, get out the car. These narcotics officers, um, real aggressive, you know. I, I say, you know, what's the reason? You know, your tax expired, okay? All right, so I'll, um, you know, I deal with the ass down the back of the car. You know, they, they grab my, my pistol and then they search the car. I asked, was it acceptable for this, you know, behavior to happen? So I'm asking you now, since we're on the topic of um, traffic law, what's your view put point on that? If the tags are expired, they do have a legitimate reason to pull you over. Right. Uh, one of the things that I did see during the pandemic, though, is that courts, in, for the most part, were granting people a lot of leniency and mercy. Uh, because of that, because there was clearly the understanding that the Secretary of State wasn't operating uh, the way they they could ideally, you know, but for the pandemic. Uh, so I've seen instances where people, you know, walk away without any repercussions from that aspect of it uh, by virtue of it. Um, of course, the police, as we talked about in the Graham case, is never entitled to use excessive force or abuse you. Um, one of the things, and I think this is really an important point to emphasize too, if you are a CPL holder, and it, they teach you this in just about any CPL class if they're really doing their job the way that they should, you're legally obligated to tell them that you are a CPL holder and where your firearm is. That makes the situation safe for both sides, so you really exercise good judgment in doing that. Uh, because even if you're a CPL holder and the firearm is at home, you want them to know the firearm is at home because you believe the minute they pull behind you and they run your plate, they know whether or not you're a CPL holder or not. And there's a heightened sense of alarm or, or they feel more threatened or more endangered approaching you as a CPL holder than they do. So you want to kind of, as I said earlier, using terminology to the best that you can, even if they're completely wrong, you want to try to de-escalate that situation. And you did that by alerting them that you're a CPL holder. Now, do they have a right to take your weapon? Yeah, they do, because they don't want you to use the weapon against them. Correct. But do they have a right to keep it? No. Over the long haul, no. Not, not unless they charge you with a crime. Now, if they charge you with a crime, they could keep it and hold it as evidence until the crime is resolved. But under the circumstances, or especially if the firearm is loaded or something like that, or even if it isn't, they don't know until they actually take hold of it or take possession. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry I misled you. I, I got it put in the car twice. Mm -hmm. The first time, I had my gun. This time, I'm talking about the tags. I didn't even have my gun on me. It was at home. But I told them I had two magazines in my car. So then... But, but let, let's slow yeah. that down for a okay. minute. Did you tell him that the firearm was at home? Okay. So... Mm
did they tell you why they were putting you in the back of the police car? Okay, so at that point, from a practical standpoint, they're searching for the weapon. Um, they may even be searching for contraband. Um, so from their standpoint, they're, you know, I mean, one of the things that you could do, the, the Detroit Police Department does have what you call a civilian oversight agency, an office of chief investigator where you could file a complaint uh, if you feel as though they were wrong in treating you and that our particular agency is supposed to investigate your complaint. But I'm trying to answer your question to the best of okay. my ability, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank both People of you. Need to talk afterwards a We've got another question here. Hi. I just wanted to ask, um, you said that you were in the car with your friend and they asked him for his identification, then they asked you for yours. Are you obligated if you're a passenger to give them your uh, identification or anybody, everybody that, that's in the car? That's a very good question, and you can say no, you, but you have to be very careful and cautious how you say it. Uh, you don't want to get indignant. You don't want to raise your voice. You want to be the most humble, polite manner or demeanor that you can have. You can say no, officer. I, I, I don't. You know, you could just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I can't give you my license. I'm invoking my right to remain silent. I can't hear you, ma'am, I'm sorry. You was in court, I heard that part. Mm -hmm. So when he pulled you over and he saw you and your girlfriend, he thought y'all was in a gang. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which is, you know, that's, that's one of the more important points I want to emphasize to everybody today. Even if you're in a bad encounter with the police, do whatever you can to survive it. Do whatever you can to kind of lay their fears or their concerns and, and, and try to calm the situation down as much as you can by being calm. Um, the, I think the thing I would say directly about your friend is important to emphasize this. In my situation and your friend's situation, Anytime the police start asking for information, they're investigating. They're not asking for information just to quote unquote be friendly. They, they want to know who your friend is. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat uh, that asks, is it, are the police able to say if they pull you over, give me your keys or I'll take you to jail? Unfortunately, they do that. I mean, that's such a, a, a limited, small part of what a quote unquote, what that complete story is. Uh, one of the legal terms that we use oftentimes on both sides in, in the justice system is called totality of the circumstance. Why did they ask uh, for the keys or, you know, things of that nature? Was the person driving drunk? Was, you know, was it a bad plate? I mean, what, what's the reason you're asking for the keys? What, was there something about the driving that they encountered 
uh, that they felt as though um, endangered, you know, the community or whatever. It's more to it than just a police officer doesn't, I mean, even a worse police officer, uh, especially, I think the beauty about technology now, and by this I mean the body cams and the dash cams, is that it takes it out of he said, she said stuff now to what objectively does that technology say? Um, and I'll tell you a, another little funny point. I attended a, a seminar yesterday with a bunch of attorneys, and one of them advised, and I think this is a very good advice, sometimes if uh, an officer is not necessarily being honest about a situation, the video turns up missing and things of that nature. And he said, this w w one of my friends said he had a case where he not only requested it through the discovery process that we talked about earlier, but he also requested the body in the dash cam through the Freedom of Information Act request. And he said the funny thing about doing that is that on a criminal case in the criminal discovery process, they're going into the courtroom and the officer in charge is telling them, well, we don't have the video for you. He's like, oh, don't worry about it. I got it through the Freedom of Information Act request. We could go in there and watch it right now. So I'm saying it to say, you know, there have been games. Um, and, you know, I would be curious to see what the video will reveal behind a situation where they just ask you, you know, for your keys, you know, from the body cam or dash. Because although Detroit is mandated, most of the suburban communities have followed suit and most of them have body cams and not dash cams uh, with their officers as well. Thank you. One, la one last question. I think you've done an awesome job in explaining, and I think you're saying exactly what Johnny Cochran used to say. Remember, it's easier to fight for you in court when you're alive. And what you've said to us and what needs to be conveyed online and everywhere else is swallow your pride, get through the traffic stop, and beat on the other side of the court. Beat it alive instead of your family rewarding through death. But my other question is, or, or comment is, the importance, of, when I used to work for 36th District Court, the importance of judges seeing family in the court the first day, not when the sentence day comes. What is your comments or your suggestions to make sure people are not, it's too late to be ashamed, you're already in trouble. The importance of people recognizing that your family and community being in the court way before it's, okay, I'm looking at 10 years or whatever. This embarrassment thing is just killing our communities with people not showing up in court or either they call the preacher and then we're the only one there. Your mama not there, your cousin not there. They don't even know you're in trouble. You know, the importance of the community totally being there. But thank you for the information that I've heard even online before getting here and uh, uh, upon arriving here. Thank you to whoever was the brainchild of this and, and putting this on. You can't overlook the fact that we need this in our community and thank you to the whole team, whoever uh, did it, because uh, we all just, a lot of us just came from D.C., but even at the National Black uh, Bar, they talked about, you know, we got to stop worrying about suing and just staying alive. We got so many people just dying because our children and our adults got attitudes. And, you know, the hell with attitude. If that officer got an issue, he might be mental. Just arrive alive. With that, Jermaine, let's say thank you to Jermaine Weirich for a wonderful presentation. Um, <clears throat> this is put on by the NAACP Detroit chapter, as well as the Wayne County Community College District. We're gonna go to another panel now, and I'm gonna ask if my panelists will all come up for a blunt talk. We'll give you two, two minutes so we can get settled. So relax for a couple of minutes and we'll be right with you.
afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this afternoon. We now have this distinguished panel that comes to you to talk about blunt talk. Not frank talk, blunt talk. In short, marijuana laws and the cannabis industry. And so we put together a distinguished panel this afternoon, four folks, and I'm gonna try to give you just a very, very brief biography, biographical introduction of each, and then we're gonna have each one of them talk for about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, about who they are and what they do. All right, to my immediate left is Mr. Dewan Fisher. He's the founder and president of First Class Consulting. He specializes in employee relations, labor laws, collective bargaining, and et cetera. Of course, he's a native Detroiter, and he's very active professionally in the human resource field. To his left is Keontae Humphreys. She has the great pleasure of serving as the chief of staff for Detro Detroit City Council Pro Tem James Tate, Jr. And she uh, is very knowledgeable in the fields related to legislation and regulation relating to food trucks, cannabis business licenses, and residential and commercial vitalization. She's also provides oversight of municipal and federal funds for the councilman's office. To her left is Donna Maria Thornton. She too is a native Detroiter, as all our panelists, and she is the quality assurance person as the CEO, that means chief executive officer, of City Labs, LLC. And then finally, we ran out, round out our panel this morning, this afternoon, with Catherine Blakely to my far left. She has extensive experience in opiate dependent management, administration, and clinical supervision. She's currently the chief operating officer and the clinical director of New Light Recovery Center as well as the owner of Lane the Foundation Training Institute. So I'm gonna ask each of you, just give us a little bit of information about yourself, what we might hear today, just tease us a little bit about what's on the uh, agenda uh, for this afternoon. Start with Catherine since we introduced you last. Good afternoon. Well, I know there's a lot of controversy discussing marijuana. So just to tease you just for a moment, we're gonna have a little fight today and we're gonna have a debate. All right, and we're gonna have some real blunt talk. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, Donna, you think you can top that? <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I am the founder of City Labs. My name is Donna Thornton. And what a lot of people do not realize is there's a large process that goes along with putting cannabis products out into the community for sale and consumption and usage. Keate? Good afternoon again, everyone. Um, what would I want folks to know that the city of Detroit is actively um, in, entering into the it's on entering into the marijuana industry, and I call it an industry because we are at the precipice of what many remember, could remember, maybe even read in history books about the automotive industry. This is not just about retail licenses so folks can go in and buy. It is the opportunity for businesses like City Lab to create jobs and training programs to provide. Um, similar to what we think of tobacco, tobacco industry, right, where you can go into a lab, produce, grow, um, and sell across the country. And so we are now at a, at a setting here in the city of Detroit where we have the opportunity to bring an industry here 
not just marijuana for consumption, but an industry here that is a viable multi-billion dollar industry to the city of Detroit. Dewan? Thank you and good afternoon. I am the um, president and founder of First Class Consulting Firm. We are a professional employer organization. Um, I will be discussing and assisting the effects of marijuana usage in um, maintaining job employment and some of the concerns dealing around HR concerns and federal regulations as well. Okay, so let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> All right, so Catherine, you started it. I started it. My first question is, because uh, you know I'm I'm old school, and I come back from that uh, environment where marijuana was evil. And why should somebody like me, or should somebody like me, all of a sudden embrace this marijuana industry? Because I believe Keontae, when she says it's going to produce a lot of jobs. Why? What's the, what's the consequences of marijuana use? It has consequence, consequences are in your brain and the effect that long-term and short-term loose does have on you. So the ability for your frontal lobe to process effectively is challenging. And despite what people believe, one in six people do become addicted to marijuana. Now there is that controversy, the other side, and two other debates that could be had. Of course, that there is medical ma marijuana and the benefits from that for, for physiological and uh, emotional uh, effects that has positive effects and its uses and certainly uh, from a medical perspective the industry is needed in order to treat people with marijuana um, and effect effectively make change so somebody from the old school versus the new school and the food food for thought and making a decision to say they're both positive and negative impacts so when we look at it from a medical perspective it is very beneficial chronic pain, dealing with various uh, psycho uh, diseases of the brain. It ha reduces anxiety. So whether we choose to use something that we call from a medicinal standpoint, and for everything that we can do from a medicinal standpoint, there are those holistic things that we can do to also to impact medical and physiological disorders. So the debate will range on, but I see both the positive and the negative of it. On the treatment side of it, the marijuana person that is addicted by diagnosis of being addicted to marijuana and having a substance use disorder, they're very difficult to treat. They can be treated, but it is challenging. Because of the disruption of the frontal lobe, um, it's one of the most difficult clients that I've ever had to treat because they don't remember what you just said. So um, it is challenging. I said, what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> because they don't remember what you just said. Don't remember what you said. Long-term use does affect your memory. Okay, so Keontae. Yeah, you next. I'm next. Because <laughs> you said it was going to be a billion-dollar industry. That means you're going to be selling a whole lot of dope. <laughs> How do you justify that in the face of the medical community saying it's going to negatively impact physiologically people? Well, I think it's important that we create laws to regulate, right? And so this is not a free-for-all. We're not saying um, come to Detroit and you can get high all day and there's no repercussions, there's no laws. We're not, we're not creating that type of system. But I think um, I'm old enough but young enough to remember when people didn't want casinos downtown. Um, but the casino revenue is what has kept a lot of Detroiters um, employed from uh, gar DSW and garbage pickup to potholes and speed humps, right? And so when we create a system where we can regulate it so that those who need help with substance abuse, there are funds um, provided through the taxation, through the legalization and taxation of marijuana to provide additional programming, therapeutic programming, um, medicinal services for those who may need treatment. Um, the uh, industry allows you to do that. Black market doesn't, right? Black market says that if my family believes there's an intervention or, my, or I believe that I need an intervention, then I go to services. A legal industry allows us to raise revenue and funds to support programs like Ms. Um, Thornton. 
Blakely. Blakely, my apologies, Ms. Blakely just mentioned. Um, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to debate the uh, impact or effects, but I will say that from tobacco to gambling um, to alcohol, these are all things that when used responsibly, um, adults, not children, adults can and will find services that they need and or partake um, in a way that benefits them. What about what uh, one of the speakers said earlier, that children are, are the best investigators and detectives <laughs> that we can ever uh, meet? <laughs> if, if, because let me be fr very frank with you. We had a real spirited discussion this morning about children getting a hold of guns and children shooting children. And the uh, grown-ups didn't intend for that to happen. But since kids are so smart, they really learn fast. They figured out how to get the gun, how to put the bullets in it, and how to shoot it. So now, what about that with marijuana, for instance? They aren't supposed to use it, but they'll figure out where it is and how to smoke it. Well, I'll, I'll just say that there are children, many of with, with uh, different types of palsies, um, cancers. And so we just have to be careful um, to always remember that adult use means just that. So the city of Detroit has regulated adult use marijuana. If a child um, is caught with marijuana, they are underage, is, they have different penalties than even an adult because an adult can move around with a, a minimal amount of ounces on their bodies. And so um, not here at all to defend, and I would say Pro Tem is right there um, in echoing that, that the, what, we, what he has brought to the city of Detroit and city council has approved is for the consumption of adults. When children get into cars without licenses and drive around, when children smoke cigarettes and do all the things that they're not supposed to do until they reach a certain age, um, we have laws in place to deal with that. Um, and we also have social services available to children who find themselves in a position that need them. Um, so I love, the, I love the debate, but you're not going to get me to defend <laughs> consumption by children unless that child obviously, and there is a caregiver also uh, responsible for that child and the consumption. Um, but the city of Detroit, let's be clear, we have only legalized adult use marijuana, not that for children with the exception of any child who, is, who has a medical license and also has a caregiver responsible for that child with a similar license. Okay, so Donna, you're a CEO. You got your own company. Uh, you heard what she just said. This is just for adult use. Now, I can remember as a kid, guys going to dr work drunk. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they, it's, 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 it's ironic because I'm an attorney, and I had a client who will remain unnamed who got picked up for drunk driving, and he uh, failed a blood alcohol test. They locked him up in jail, and they locked him up on Friday, and on Monday, they took him to court. Monday, he was still drunk. <laughs> he still failed a blood alcohol test, <laughs> okay? So what does that do? I know we talk about alcohol, but now we're talking about marijuana, which is not as readily detectable. What is, that, what is the concern of a CEO? Well, first of all, let me um, clarify that my business is to test marijuana before it goes out into the public for consumption and usage. Uh, I don't sell, I'm not trying to sell, I'm not trying to grow, but just like any food or beverage that hits the market in a grocery store or into any um, gas station or any other convenient place, uh, it has to be tested and regulated by the FDA, et cetera. So the state of Michigan has put in a lot of rules, regulations for um, license, people with licenses, regardless of what area they're in. Uh, and one of my um, areas is to make sure that it's not, the potency is not too high, there's not um, pesticides, mildews, molds, and other drugs in the cannabis before it goes into the dispensary which is one of the biggest things um, that we are making sure that, uh, for the regulations. Another thing that you just touched upon really is close to my heart because I am a former public school principal of 28 years. And when you mentioned children in school, um, 
the drugs and guns and things like that that's close to my heart. Uh, one of the things I just debated on the news the other day, about a month ago, uh, was the bringing of cannabis products into the schools. For example, they're bringing in edibles, gummies, beverages, things like that. How do we stop that? Is it a parent's responsibility? Is it the school's responsibility? Well, that becomes one of the things I stated was it's a parent responsibility. Anything that is illegal, just like liquor, as uh, County just said, and um, uh, cigarettes, things like that, those are legal things. Guns, they're legal. So you have to modify, and, and we have to have a talk with parents, and parents need not be friends with their children, and we need to start there, because anything that's legal has to be um, done in moderation. And so that's a, that's a start at home. That's a start at home. Um, I always tell my students, you know, it's illegal for you before it became illegal. Uh, I mean, before it became legal, it's illegal for you as a child. So is liquor, so is uh, drugs and guns, all that. You can't bring it to school. You can't consume it, et cetera. So that touches my heart a lot, and I see it happening a lot, and that begins at the home. So we need to talk about parent and parenting skills on that talk. Uh, that's a whole nother debate, like, <laughs> like Catherine just said. You know, that's a whole nother debate when you talk about that area. But in order for things to be um, consumed and put on the market for sale, it has to be tested. That's where I come in, make sure that those things are um, in place. And I'm working with the city council directly to make sure that we're on point with that. So you heard that, Dewan? Yes, sir. All right, she punted. <laughs> <laughs> she punted the ball to you. Because employment relations is your specialty. Yes. So, uh, Keontae, she's just trying to get more jobs. Um, <laughs> Donna, she's going to test it to make sure it don't kill people. Uh, Catherine, uh, she knows that it messes up the mind. So, what is an employer to do? We are living in a day and age now where it is very hard to find good workers. Um, I'm working with a municipality right now where um, we are searching for police officers. We are trying our best to recruit and maintain good employees. However, there is a municipality, I'm not gonna name, that have a particular ordinance where it allows the city workers that work inside of the city hall to consume or to use but if our firefighters or if any um employee that is federal federal regulated um of course they can't use it it makes it difficult um, for us to properly create a plain even field because even in our collective bargaining union agreements some departments that cannot consume this recreational uh, use wants to be compensated even more because they can't partake in an activity that they want to indulge in outside of work because it will affect their job. So we are living in a day and age where it, yes, it's a billion dollar industry. However, we understand even on the HR sense that if you have the consumption, it slows down your response time. Uh, not only does it slow down your response time, it, it also causes other effects to your job where you can't perform adequately. So our stance point is we have to take a, a close look at the job description to determine whether or not, and this, since it's a PEO that I have, it's gonna be different from every organization that I deal with. Some organizations are nonprofits, some of them are you know, municipalities or a plant. Anytime you're dealing with heavy equipment, whenever you're dealing with um, firearms, police officers, we're going to always steer away from the use of allowing the employer to fall into that trap, to allow their employees to partake in that activity. Okay, so let me see if I understood what you just said. First of all, let me have Keontae explain just a little bit what has been passed by the city of Detroit. Okay, go ahead. Well, 
as of right now, the city of Detroit has a number of ordinances that have legalized um, adult consumption or adult use marijuana. Um, it is provided for um, minimal amounts of marijuana on the person. And so um, we have decriminalized um, having marijuana on the person if you're stopped by police or something along those lines. Um, as it relates to employment, because we are a government entity, um, we are a drug-free <laughs> employer um, because we, provi we, we use federal funds to, to pay out folks. We receive federal funds to provide programming. Um, I will say that there have been a number of businesses, though, that have uh, partnered with the city to provide additional employment through Detroit at Work, through our homegrown Office of Marijuana Ventures to provide jobs that have policies that say you cannot consume. So many people might know folks with pens, right? You'll see people out and about um, with pens. So you can't, their policies are you cannot consume on the premises of your job or, or during business hours, but they do not drug test, right? Um, and so there is still, I think the system, the society is still figuring out um, the, the balance between saying you can't consume on site, and this is not a city policy, like I said, these are some of our partners, um, but you cannot consume on site with um, also giving you the opportunity to consume on your private time. Uh, but as it relates to the city, we have decriminalized it for uh, personal possession. We have legalized the industry so that businesses like City Labs can receive a business license from the city of Detroit, if, if the business is in the city of Detroit, to operate businesses, everything from grow to consumption lounge and everything that's in between there. Um, we have also provided ordinances or regulations around land use. So you cannot be within right now a thousand feet of a school, of a adult foster care, a church, a, ch a foster care home, daycare facility, liquor stores, billiards halls, motorcycle club. Um, and so, and, and me, again, I'm old enough but young enough to remember that when it first came to the city of Detroit through medicinal, it was, many people said it was the wild, wild west, right? You saw all of these green signs pop up all over the city. Pro Tem Tate worked diligently to reverse that trend, and we really feel like we've gotten it right this time around in creating uh, distancing requirements, or shadows as we call them, within land use. So you've got to be a certain amount of feet or distance away from a controlled use, from a drug-free zone, um, from churches, et cetera. Um, and we are in the process. Um, of, of actually tweaking our laws as it relates to zoning or land use because we just closed on October 1st, excuse me, our most recent round of marijuana licensing opportunities for, uh, for opportunities for businesses to get new licenses to enter into the adult use industry. And so um, if you're looking to do a grow um, or cultivation, those are what we call our unlimited licenses. We are not putting limits on the number of uh, businesses that come in to do um, front end work as it relates to secure transport, um, testing, those kinds of licenses. But in our limited license category on October 1st, we just closed the window for anybody interested in a limited license, um, cult I'm sorry, processing, uh, retail consumption, those licenses, if you wanted to get one. The window just closed, but we're coming back in about six months with another opportunity for people to get into that, as well as micro businesses. And I, I, I want to end here to say that micro business is something that's really important because, you know, the war on drugs was real. Many folks were still living in what, what we know as the war on drugs. And so whether you or somebody you know has been growing in their basement <laughs> for years, um, spent time incarcerated because of possession and or illegal activity or, or around marijuana. That micro business allows folks to basically take those skills that they've been using and apply it in a legalized way to this industry to grow, to sell, to package, to brand um, marijuana, to really enter in this industry. Um, and th that, although that window closed in the, with the limited license, we are bringing two more phases to the, to the city um, the first again in about six months, so next spring. So um, your question was, where are we? We have legalized it. We have opportunities for people to come um, into this industry. And I can't, you're going to hear me say that word probably a million times before I get up. Because this is not about black market, street corner, marijuana consumption or purchasing. It is about allowing black and brown people, Detroit natives, Detroit legacies, people who qualify as social equity applicants, 
and go look up all those words or meet me after and I'll explain them to you, to enter into this industry in a legalized way um, to, to actually be a part of this multi-billion dollar effort. Okay, now, but when I heard Dewan say, and I'm asking this, I'm gonna ask Catherine Blakely this question, and you, Dewan, because at the NAACP, you know, we read the Constitution that said all men are created equally. And now I'm hearing Dewan say, except if you work in a certain industry, you can't get high. I didn't say at work. I said away from work is what he said. You cannot use marijuana in your personal life because you are, use a firearm or you're in an emergency situation, you're a first responder, you work, work, use heavy equipment, etc. So we aren't all equi created equally by this law. Catherine, Absolutely. what happens to the mind, to the brain of a janitor as opposed to a fireman or a police officer? The same thing. Okay. How, however, what, however I, what I'll say also at, from HR and having to hire people and working in the treatment, recovery, and prevention industry, we have to test our employees randomly. We often have discussions as leadership about how we look at marijuana, but because we take federal dollars, we can't hire somebody that's actively using marijuana. And um, a person, you're human, you can live your life, but if, if uh, you go out on a weekend, you don't know whether your, your job is going to do a drug test. Um, we go out and we drink, we gamble. Um, we're humans and we, we do those things. So from an individual and your own personal responsibility and recognizing that even though you're not punched in the clock, whoever you represent, when you walk off the clock, you still represent them. So if, if Catherine Blakely decides to use some marijuana, gets pulled over by the police, okay, I don't, I can use it recreationally, but the headlines will say, Catherine Blakely, the CEO of New Light Recovery Center, the clinical director who teaches training on ethics and lay in the foundation, got pulled over and was arrested for being high. So wherever you are, no matter, I know we punch the clock and we want to be done, but you still wear that hat. So HR, we have a very difficult time finding people to come work. And it is a decision that people now have to make because of that of career choice. If you know you want to actively smoke marijuana, that's fine, that's your life. However, with that being said, the industry that I work in may not be for you. So the industry that, um, that uh, firemen, policemen, really have to reconsider your job. And if, if you can't abide by the code of ethics, because everybody should be signing one, that might not be for you. And, with, uh, and I, with that being said, from that level of responsibility, so whether you have medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, that old thing we used to have, that medicine cabinet, some stuff just needs to be locked up. And we can prevent a problem before it starts by locking up your edibles, by locking up your medication, just like you're supposed to do that gun. And then you can keep your family safe and other people safe when they come to visit your house. Because you know you go in somebody's house and use their bathroom, you still look in their medicine cabinet. <laughs> so, Dewan, how do you handle that, man? You, you have to have company policies set in place. Um, as she was um, just articulating, that you are still a representation of the company even outside of your nine to five. And most code of conducts that we create, we always put a representation clause in there that if you do something outside um, of the normal nine to five, you know, you, you still have to represent us. Um, and if you violate that, that is grounds for termination. It makes it difficult when you have collective bargaining units because if I'm in a plant and you go and you're in an accident in a high low and we send you for a drug test, we cannot, or the, the person that's testing for mar marijuana or the drug test, they can't tell if you're actively high or not. So it makes it difficult. But we understand that you can be high anywhere from one to what, three hours of it. 
So it, it makes it very difficult. And we have to understand that it's been approved on a state level, but it hasn't been approved on a federal level. Right. And because it hasn't been approved on a federal level, then that means that the employer has its own constitution or bylaws that it can abide by that doesn't violate federal laws. That's why a lot of, of us that, that's up here keep saying, hey, if you're getting re funds from the federal government or federal contracts, or you're working with them, you can't partake in it, it's because it hasn't been approved on a, on a federal level yet. So it's the, the employer's job to ensure that we have the policies in place that we can speak and educate our employees. The, the thing that I've seen in, in the years, especially since it's been legalized, that most people are not taking this because of a medical condition. They want to take it and partake in it because they want that, that high. But there's other things that can supplement for an excuse. I, I don't want to say excuse. <laughs> um, <laughs> that can supplement for their use. There's a difference. In, in marijuana, there is something called THC. But then there are certain companies that have t taken the THC out of it, and they call it, what, C CBD. CBD, which has somewhat of the same effects as it relates to um, dealing with depression, dealing with uh, anxiety, uh, aches and pains, and et cetera, that it takes that formula out of marijuana of getting high. And these are alternatives that I'm finding that more and more employers are starting to push instead of using the consumption of marijuana. I want to jump know, in real quick to say this to, to folks out there. So maybe you can't be a teacher, can't drive a bus, um, can't be a police officer, but the city of Detroit is offering a job fair for marijuana industry businesses. <laughs> And We're going to uh, charge you for that commercial. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, so maybe you want to learn more about the grow industry. Maybe you want to learn more about packaging and branding. On, on October 26th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Horatio Williams Foundation at 1010 Antonium in Detroit. Um, so that first day of the 26th is from 6 to, 6 to 9. We're coming back the next day, October 27th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. again at the Horatio Williams Foundation. Um, for a job fair, these are active jobs. They are looking to do on-sites to hire people into this industry for businesses that exist here in the city of Detroit. Okay, okay. with that in mind, Go ahead. real sorry. quickly, real okay. quickly. I, I, I like her, her plug, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> if, if we are, and I'm not against the industry, but if we continue to push job promotion in this industry, then we are losing out on teachers and police officers, and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard for HR uh, and, and employers to find good workers because everyone's doing Uber because they want to partake in certain activities and it's hurting our community. And you, and, and we, 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 we want our community to grow. We want them to be employed, but there are some key jobs that is essential for our children and our children's children, and if everyone is going into this industry, then it cripples the educational system, it cripples the justice system, our police officers, even the trucking as well. So these are things that we gotta be mindful on when we hear these things. And, and again, I, I'm not against it, I'm just saying that we have to be mindful in how it will affect the community at large. Quick question for Donna. Do you uh, run into a lot of counterfeit uh, drugs, when you're doing your test. And I ask that because uh, we find that uh, you, get, you get these overdoses and whatnot, and illnesses, I should say, not overdose, uh, associated with drug use, not just marijuana. And so how does that weigh in on your business? Well, there are regulations. There's a metric system that has to be um, followed, and you input your data in there, and um, so that kind of tracks the amount of um, the, the samples that fail, the strains that fail. So there is a way to track the, um, um, the um, strains that don't pass regulations. And then there's also a procedure for dis uh, disposing. You can't just throw it out. You just can't say, here, you want to take this home and smoke it or try it out. You can't do that. Um, so there are some really 
um, key points there. Not a lot of counterfeit as far as I'm, I, I've experienced. Um, but I do have some numbers for you for around the possession. I brought those numbers with me. Up to 2.5 ounces, there's no penalty if you have that on your body. If you have up to 10 ounces in the home, there's no penalty. But when you start carrying more than that on your body, then you are subject to $500 penalties and things like that. And then some sales and distribution as well. Uh, there are limits on those. Uh, it was something that um, I think you picked. You, I want to see what you said. You said something about um, hiring and firing. And I have, my concern is that if, it's the same thing. It's legal. You're not going to come to work drunk. You're not going to come to work. You know, I'm not going to take a shot. At least I shouldn't be taking a shot before I go into my job. I shouldn't be taking a puff off my blunt before I go into my job. But one of the things that as a uh, up and coming business, um, we have to do business in the city of Detroit. We have to have a hiring uh, amount of personnel from the city of Detroit. That's what the city council has instilled. There are, and we have to hire people who have these backgrounds. So people who have these backgrounds, which I'm glad to know that our president has just pardoned all of the, uh, two days ago, has pardoned all of the hard offenses uh, for possession of, of uh, marijuana. So that's really great on Biden, our president. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that because so many of our black and brown Hispanic people are in jail for things that are legal now. So it's really wonderful to see them coming out of jail uh, with his pardon. But um, I am a legacy person, something that um, we just mentioned, and Keontae just mentioned. I'm a legacy person. I'm also a, um, a social, um, equity. social equity applicant, which means that I'm a legacy person, which um, that kind of took my stuff it's away. I'm just saying. I'm just that saying means you're a, native, you're a native Detroiter. Yeah, so oh. I lived in the city of Detroit all my life. I've been raised and born here. I taught here. I was an administrator in the city of Detroit. I have backgrounds here. And I would like to be part of this industry. So many have been affected by this industry. I've, in my, I live right down the street from Focus Hope. So right down the street from Focus Hope, Linwood, Dexter area, that area has been, you know, traumatized by, you know, the influx of drugs, and not just drugs, just all kind of crime. So I'm glad to see that the city is giving back and coming back, um, and not just the cannabis industry, but in all kind of areas of the growth of the city. The city council is doing a wonderful job. Okay, so we've got to wrap up now, but I'm going to give each one of you 30 seconds. No more. Say whatever you want to say. We'll start with Dewan. I think that it's very important that we uh, understand the effects of the community as at large. Um, we have to keep in mind that this is approved on a state level and not federal level. Um, and that being said, when it comes into hiring and firing, um, we, if you give a person an inch, sometimes they'll take a mile. And we have to be mindful of this and creating these laws and regulations to really monitor the usage and um, we, we got to be understanding as well. Just this day and age is changing. So I rest with that. Keontae? Um, if you want to enter into the industry in a lawful way, um, I'm going to continue to push it because I think there's a space and opportunity for us, as, particularly as black and brown people and Detroiters, to get a piece of the pie, a pie that was oftentimes said we could not participate in. And we lost a lot of brothers and sisters to the war on drugs. Um, and so this is an opportunity in the city of Detroit to, to, legal, to be a part of a legal industry. And to learn more about it, please visit um, Detroit Homegrown. You can also check out Pro Tim's social media um, and his city council webpage where you can find a lot of information on job fairs, on licensing opportunities, FAQs. We are here to educate Detroiters on how to enter this industry legally. Donna? I'm timing myself. <laughs> 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 um, okay, again, as a person and a business coming into your neighborhood, one of the responsibilities we have is to have a good neighborhood plan. We are going to ensure that we hire 60% of the residents. We're going to make sure that we beautify the community in which we are um, involved in. We're going to make sure that we have approval of our community. We're going to also ensure that the, um, the cannabis that comes out on the, on to sale into the community is, um, is, is up to par, is healthy, and it's not filled with other drugs and contaminants. Catherine? 
Well, one thing I want to make sure I leave everybody with, regardless of which side of the fence you're on, whether you're for or against, or just listening to our discussion today, know that there is help for anyone that has a problem. You can contact the Detroit Wayne County Integrated Mental Health Authority 24 hours, seven days a week at 1-800-241-4949 and always seek help. Uh, and no matter what you do, take responsibility in your homes for your actions and lock your medication up, no matter if it even comes in a form of candy. Thank you all for being here now. I'm gonna go out on the limb a little bit and I'm gonna take a non-scientific uh, survey. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who thinks it was wrong for the city to license marijuana, raise your hand. Wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> You're against it. See that? Nobody raised their hand except me. <laughs> so that gives you a state of the situation I want everybody to remember what Dewan said. Where are, where are our teachers going to come from? And the reason I say this is because I've been a practicing attorney for over 40 years. And I, I, I practice in the field of labor relations. And one of the things that struck me for the last, I don't know how many years, is how many people couldn't get a job when marijuana was illegal. And now that it is legal, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to get a job. It just means that they're going to be funneled into certain jobs, and the others are going to be, I mean, we're talking about a, a splintered society developing here, the high and the not high. Those are my thoughts for today, Ms. Landrum. Thank you all for being here. This is a, a presentation of the George W. Crockett Law School, which is a part of the Thurgood Marshall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, initiative. Do we have questions? Okay, a statement. Come on up here. I'll give you my mic. You can make your statement. I will. Uh, to DeWan specifically, you know, um, if you look, if you look at uh, the difference between a cigarette and marijuana, it's almost the same thing. People that smoke cigarettes, they chase a certain high, a certain uh, way of feeling that they want to feel at the end of the day. So it's, I don't think it should be too much discriminated against. Okay, I'm gonna ask Ms. Blakely, is that true? It is a carcinogen. It will have the same impact as far as your lungs. There, there is, I won't say a euphoric re, uh, effect that comes from cigarette smoking. It is something that's called nicotine dependency, and you can become chemically dependent to the nicotine that's in there. So yes to uh, a portion of the similarity, but dependent on levels, frequency, um, the amount of damage increases with both items. What about on your frontal lobe? Compare nicotine to marijuana. Well, nicotine doesn't have effect on your frontal lobe. Exactly. Any other questions? Ms. Landrum? Ms. Uh, <laughs> Come on. That's like driving impaired. You can't drink and drive. You can't, you know, can't smoke and drive. It's illegal. And I just want to say, be careful with smoking. Marijuana, is, marijuana actually is consumed now more often outside of a cigarette type. Um, blunt is a street term. But outside of a cigarette type of substance, it is actually consumed more so in other ways than just smoking. But to your question, the answer to that is you cannot consume, whether that's you want to pop a gummy, you want to put something else in your mouth, whatever it is, put on, um, even if you decide to inhale in some other type of way, you cannot consume marijuana while operating a vehicle. 
I'd like to also make a comment <clears throat> about the smoking. Um, so there are these pins that are in this, the gas stations and things. They're called Breeze, and some of them, and there, there are other names for them as well, but uh, some of them are um, tobacco, and some of them are TAC. So if you, if you see people going in, especially children, they're going to, you know, young people, they're going to because they can get it from the gas station. So that, like, that comes to another problem there. But um, so sometimes you'll see people smoking, they're vaping, they're not necessarily doing THC. So there's two different kinds that are out there, and there are a lot more than two, but there are basically two different kinds out there, THC and one that has tobacco in them. And so you can, you're supposed to only be able to get the TAC ones in the dispensaries. Um, so the provisioning centers is a technical term, but yes. Thank you, panel members. I'd like to bring to you now our executive director, Ms. Camilla Landrum. Thank you. Hi. We're really just wrapping up. Uh, I wanna say thank you to the panel. I know you guys are about to come down. Thank you to all the audience members that have participated today. Um, want to invite you this coming Thursday. Toy, is it Thursday? Thursday. This coming Thursday, the Detroit Branch and AACP and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated will host a uh, ballot box discussion. It's an event uh, geared toward making sure everyone understands the state proposals that'll be on the November 8th ballot. Uh, proposal one talks about financial disclosures and term limits, proposal two, expanding voting rights, and proposal three, reproductive rights for women. So we have explanations and presenters for each of those proposals. The event will be right over here on Howard Street. Uh, please invite someone to join us. This is an educational forum to make sure everyone can speak properly and accurately about the ballot proposals and how they will impact all of our lives. Thank you again to our panelists. Have a great rest of your day. Bye to our Zoomers who are uh, still with us. We appreciate you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you so much. Well, don't forget, for those of y'all who are here, next Saturday, we're here again at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 to 2.